Good evening. Um, I'd like to call to order the school board meeting of February 10th, 2015. And I'd like to um, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to um, thank you all for your patience. I know that we were a few minutes late getting started this evening. Um, I'm, we will try not to uh, have too many other delays as the evening moves on. Um, first item on the agenda are adjustments to the agenda. Do we have any? No? Thank you. Um, second item on the agenda is the approval of the school board minutes. Do I have a motion? I make, a mo I make a motion that we approve the school board minutes from January 27th. 2A and B. Uh, 2A and B, or January 13th, sorry. Second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you, Susan. Sorry. <laughs> um, third on the agenda is always my favorite part of the evening, comments from our student representatives. Um, Natalie? So I think last time we had the meeting, it was right before midterms, and so midterms are over, and we're in the second semester now. Midterms went well, I think. Um, I would say that we're getting into the swing of things with the second semester, but we're not really, because we haven't had a full week of school since before <laughs> midterms started. Um, I'm sure your parents feel that pain as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've had a lot of um, delays, late starts, snow dates, early releases, but um, it's Spirit Week right now, which is Winterfest, which is organized by the sophomores, um, so that's been going really well, and we have the assembly on Friday, which is going to be a half day, and then we have February break, um, so it does kind of feel like we just had a break for midterms, and now it's almost February break, which is nice, um, and yeah. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, item four on our agenda this evening. Thank you, David. Comments from the public on the agenda items. Do we have any comments? Seeing none. Um, item five on our agenda. Look at that. We're making up for lost time. Communications. Um, under communications is the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. Um, I believe we have a presentation this evening from our curriculum coordinator, Ruth Ellen Vaughn. Welcome, Ruth. Very brief. Very brief. Thank you. Look at that, making up more time. In the interest of an extremely full agenda, um, I'm going to just give a very brief overview, and then if you have any questions, I can either entertain those now or come back with more expanded comments for you later. Um, the main educational assessment that we have seen in the past has been NECAP for grades 3 through 8 and the SAT for grade 11. That is shifting this year to Smarter Balanced. Um, it will be like the former assessments in that it still is going to assess both math and reading. The difference in the assessments is the way that those are being given. Um, they will be computer-based tests. They will have two separate sections, unlike the NECAP. One section will be more like the NWEA test that we've given in district. It's computer adaptive. So it levels to where the student is. It'll start with a question. The first um, section of the test, probably about the first half, is at grade level, and then it will start to level out where the student is. So the questions will get a little bit easier if they've not been answering well. If they're answering very well, they'll get progressively harder. And then the second part of the test is a performance task where the students are given an opportunity to participate in a classroom activity the day or two before, get background information on a particular topic, and then they're given an opportunity to apply math and or reading principles to separate sections 
to a more in-depth problem. And this is where the application part comes in. It's not just, here's a simple addition problem, please give us the answer. It's going to be take data, collect it, analyze it, project, and reach a conclusion from what's in front of them. It's going to be more in-depth than they've seen on larger scale assessments in the past. We have um, this week our teacher training for giving those tests has started. We've finally gotten pieces released from the DOE so that we can do that. Our training for students in using the tools on the iPads will begin in March and the testing window for our district will begin March 30th. Will those results be shared with parents this year out, or is this just a pilot season? This is for the purposes of establishing the benchmarks for the test. And so the results that we get back this year are more aggregate than they are individual. So will parents see the results from those? Their own I believe there will be some student results given, but it's not going to be the same full-scale reports that they've gotten in the past. Moving forward, we should be getting more information. <coughs> this year, it's going to be more limited. And because it's it, the first year that they're giving it, so they're kind of establishing the benchmarks. And given that it's more of a pilot year, how will that data be used? The school report cards that typically are based partly on that data will be based solely on our participation rate this year, not on necessarily where kids are scoring as far as our schools in need of improvement or is this a school that's in good shape. Um, moving forward next year and beyond, it will be used as the NCLB accountability test. This year that accountability is for participation only. <coughs> and my final question, I don't mean to hog all the board's question time. Um, will, how will the results be used to assess individual child performance? Those will be put up against other data that we have in-house from other assessments that we're giving to better understand what is being asked, but also to see where the students are on a more in-depth type of assessment that's given on a larger scale and in a format the kids haven't necessarily seen this way before. It, they will be done on iPads. Um, I think perhaps the adults are a little bit more hesitant than that than the kids will be. I think the kids will probably be fine. Um, but we are looking at wanting to make sure that we have as many of the logistics worked out so that it runs as smoothly as possible. Um, the operating system for the iPads has just been released and so we are still in the process of making sure that we have everything on our end before we start in with the kids. So. Does anyone else have any questions about the smart balance? Sure, I know I mentioned this in a uh, couple meetings ago, but um, you know, a lot of parents uh, and what we know from our kids, there's a lot of anxiety. know you know your child will be assessed why they're being assessed I think it helps teachers you know uh, it helps families knowing you know to have them prepared not to practice it but you know eat a good meal simple things like that right. I think it Absolutely. reduces anxiety so that kind of communication is helpful mm -hmm. and then in terms of you know we live in Cape Elizabeth you know it's always how did our score do versus another district but and it's, so this year, if we get our smarter balance scores back, you know, and we look at all the other districts, usually we do these charts, kneecap, how do we do versus Yarmouth uh, and Falmouth. This is a new baseline year. This so is a new baseline year, so we are looking to correlate that with some of the data that we have that's historical so that we can tell where we are in a larger context. Um, and then also be looking to see. I don't know that we'll have the comparison data across districts like we've had in the past because it's a baseline year. So we may not get to do that this year, but I don't think it's necessarily gone forever. Thank you. Any other questions for Ruth Ellen Vaughn? I 
do what we can. Um, the goal, I'm assuming the state has a bigger picture on this, and the goal is to give kids what they need, test kids on what they need so that some of the other time that we use, that we use assessments will be diminished because this is a more comprehensive test. I would say that's the overall goal, and hopefully that will be the way it plays out. We have um, a set of tests that have been packaged with this that we are not using everything this year, but there are interim tests that we can use to judge where students are along the way to this test. There are formative assessments. There is a number of resources available to teachers around this because it's testing a skill set. It's testing s standards. It's not just a test so that we can check off we've taken it. And so, yes, it is supposed to be giving us that data where we can say, we know that these students are here. We need to know that these students need a challenge, and these students need a little bit more to get where they need to be. Cynics would say that it's the state's requirement to meet federal obligations in order to receive federal funding. Um, you know, I think, again, it's up to us as a district to determine what's the best use of the data for us locally. The state will use it for our state report cards when the time comes. Um, the federal government's going to use it to determine how much money Maine should get relative to other states who are part of the No Child Left Behind or it's ECEA. Um, you know, regulations right now. Um, but again, for us, I think we are making a determination about how can we best use this to serve kids locally. Any other questions? Well, change is always a challenge. I appreciate you bringing forth as much information as possible, and I, I'm sure that you've already two steps ahead of Michael's suggestions around. There will be a letter going home at the district level, and there will be letters going home at the school levels giving more information about what the schedules will be and exactly when we need to make a good breakfast and a good night's sleep is always important, but when they're maybe a little bit more important. Oh. And I also appreciate the extra time that it takes out of our teachers' days and schedules to accommodate yet one more new yes. thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, new to our agenda this evening is um, we are very excited that we have our district leadership team from our building administrators to talk about strategic plan updates and how that's looking building by building. So i um, wondering if we have any volunteers. <laughs> you want to be first? Michael. Michael. Yes, please. Michael Tracy from the middle school. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, happy to be here to share some progress and some aspirations for, for the middle school. Um, I wanted to start by talking um, specifically around some activities that we're very excited about at the middle school that support uh, goal two of the strategic plan, and that is the building towards an inclusive and supportive district culture, and, and primarily around the idea of the looking at the social emotional development and the well-being of students. Um, we implemented a new master schedule this year that included advisory program uh, programming in, in grades seven and eight. And we're really looking at that through a lens of, of refining that work with um, work that we did with Steve Wessler on his stand up speak up um, programming. And if you'll recall, most of you were at a workshop we did last year. Uh, and we had a very powerful experience of hearing some um, examples of um, some degrading language and bias and, and those kinds of things. And we, we, um, we unpacked that together. And so we've been doing some work. We had uh, eight um, people from the middle school, seven staff members, and one seventh grade parent who just in January completed a three-day intensive training with Steve Wessler for a training of trainer models. And then those eight people are going to go forward, and we're going to have our first round of new trainers doing some student workshop sessions um, this March. And so we're excited to get that work going to tackle and unpack degrading language bias harassment um, issues and um, so that's going to be 
it's on, on, ongoing and, and happening now, so we're excited about that. We also established a civil rights team this year um, with their mission to, to get our school thinking and talking more about issues of bias, particularly around the civil rights protected classes. Um, they're creating a team, they're clarifying their purpose, and they're planning for a student-led a lot alike week to look at not only similarities that we have but embracing differences. Um, it's separate work from the Steve Wessler work, but it's also complementary. The Steve Wessler work is really about empowering individuals to stand up and speak up, whereas the civil rights team is about a team of students who are raising issues and starting conversations about, about bias and civil rights. Um, Mr. Perley and I, assistant principal, have been trying to hold regular ongoing meetings with both student council officers and various groups of students just to make sure we're checking in on the well-being of students and take, keeping a, a finger on the pulse of, of the student body and, the, and their voices. Um, we are looking into having the kindness guy uh, come to the middle school, and I know he's been around uh, at, at different schools at different times, but students have been asking um, if we could, could arrange for that to happen. And we also had some students come forward um, very interested in having um, Hunter Kent, who was uh, a TEDx presenter this year, and they'd be interested in having her come to the middle school and speak specifically about leadership, social emotional experiences, as well as raising mental health awareness. Um, and we just recently, we completed the main integrated youth health survey today. <laughs> and we're also, uh, by the end of this week, we'll have completed the student engagement surveys. So we're interested in using that data from both of those surveys to continue assessing our climate and culture work. So lots of, lots of great things, I think, around that uh, at the middle school. Um, around the goal of reducing risk of failure, increasing access for, for students, um, part of our new schedule this year is we've implemented an enrichment block and we've um, been trying a claiming system that we um, are modeling after what happens at the high school in the Achievement Center where teachers can go in and claim students uh, for various purposes, whether it's social emotional or academically based. And they'll work with students during that daily enrichment block and we're just gonna continue assessing and refining that, that model and that system. We're linking that work in the enrichment block to our response to intervention. Uh, team and support services so that we can intervene and remedy anything from problematic attendance patterns or student performance levels that may be uh, lagging at times, identifying at-risk students, and make sure we're providing support, proactive support, through both our enrichment block and our RTI model and trying to bring that all, all together. Um, our, our RTI student services team has really been repurposing itself and coming up with a new documentation system and really looking at how we can connect all of those pieces, student services team, RTI, enrichment block, and just having an ongoing cycle of support. Um, we did maintain as a, as a way of uh, maintaining data uh, for, for students to track growth. So we did give the NWEA uh, assessments in um, reading and in math and part of that is we're transitioning to the star assessment the kneecap has gone away smarter balance is coming on board and we working with um, Ruth Ellen Vaughn we decided that we want to keep that as one of our growth indicators that we're, we're we don't have anything else that's going to be constant so we'll be assessing that as we move forward but it speaks to the idea of continually using data points to track student progress and be able to intervene so we're adding the star maintaining NWEA and smarter balance is, is uh, something new and we'll, we'll see how that's going to going to work for us in terms of data um, we're doing a tremendous amount of work uh, aligning curriculum to the Common Core. Um, we've built in common planning time meetings where daily content area groups are meeting together and working on uh, development of curriculum uh, around um, understanding by design model, um, to creating common assessments, looking at student work. We have some interesting Lucy Calkins essay group scoring and writing going on. 
um, developing common assessments, as I said, and a lot of that work is we're aiming in the future for preparing for piloting um, some standards-based grading and reporting practices. But before we get there, we have to have these requisite pieces in place. So until our curriculum is fully articulated, until we have common assessments, um, until we have um, common grade level curricular experiences, we won't be ready to do standards-based grading and reporting. So we're working very hard developing and refining curriculum right now to prepare for um, standards-based grading and reporting soon. Um, we're looking for full implementation in fall of 2016, according to our strategic plan. So a lot of work to do, but we, we have to put the foundation in place for that. I'm um, sorry. Um, those are kind of the key points that, that I wanted to make. Um, as always, differentiated instruction is, is on our radar. We sent um, four of our staff members, our, our principal, me, uh, assistant principal and two teachers, uh, went down to Virginia uh, this summer and attended an outstanding uh, conference on differentiated instruction. And when we returned at the beginning of this year, we presented at the opening staff meeting and shared all of the resources from the entire workshop that we had. Um, we're excited to be offering a co-taught fifth grade math class with a special educator and regular educator teaming up um, and really continuing the focus on push in instruction rather than pull out instruction. So students being getting their academic experience with their peers in the classroom with appropriate supports. So those are some of the, the key highlights I wanted to make on our progress and our, where we're heading for the strategic plan. So. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Wow. I have a comment. Please. I'm so glad it started with um, social emotional work because, uh, as you know, we can, there's always more to learn, but if we don't know how to be in the classroom and be with our peers, the learning is um, your brain's not open, you're not ready to uh, bring things in. So. Thank you for starting with that and always continuing that in your thought process because uh, someone, some lecture I saw, uh, the person said, we want to raise smart people, but we also want to raise uh, fabulous neighbors. And so, um, you know, I just love that you're doing that. And I appreciate your work and the teacher's work to do this. I know it's a lot. Thank you, and I'll pass that along for sure. All right. Mike, um, yes, thank you for this. A very comprehensive report. By the way, I want to thank Mike for inviting me to come talk to the faculty about 250 goals a couple thank of you. weeks ago, and hopefully we have a couple of great ideas were floated around. Um, last spring, there was a lot of concern expressed about the um, change in your math pathways. How confident are you that that's going well? Do you have any feedback for us about any mid-course adjustments you've needed to make, or, or supports in place, or? How's that going? Sure. I mean, I, I, we're definitely focused on wanting to prepare kids for proficiency-based diplomas, for um, obviously for the Common Core, and so really looking at where, where are their gaps? Are we preparing, putting students on a trajectory to be successful at graduation, certainly, but for career and college readiness beyond that? So um, we definitely identified some, some key areas where there were some gaps. It's a transition year and we're trying to fill some gaps where students had experiences where they were um, accessing half of an academic program over the course of a year um, and, and some examples. So we're, we're trying to put students on a pathway where they're getting full exposure to the content standards that they're going to need to be successful in high school and beyond. So we're in transition. Um, the teachers are working hard. We're, we'll be under, certainly be undergoing some review. Um, teachers are spending a lot of time in their common planning time working with math coaches and our instructional strategists to, to work on that uh, alignment work. It, it's difficult work um, and I think with change comes some challenge, but you know I think we're definitely working through that with the end goal of are we giving students the tools and the, the access that they, they need to be successful um, and to make sure that they're having exposure to all of the content that they're going to need to get there. So, And I presume at some point this semester you, your eighth grade teachers will be in touch with high school folks to 
Absolutely. Talk about we what just, they might expect to be receiving in the yeah. fall. We recently had a meeting um, just to talk about that course selection process and some of the some of the um, some of the movement of the students from eighth to ninth grade and what some of those things are going to look like and, and some things we're going to need to continue to work together on. So, yeah. Thank you. Mike, uh, can you um, just paint a little more of a picture of the advisory program and how, that, how that's uh, working out, um, you know, what, what student experience has been like and, and how it's making a difference in the middle school? Sure. We, we began uh, this summer with a group of interested staff members on looking at um, not an overly scripted or prescribed curriculum, but some key areas that we wanted to make sure we were offering for students um, in seventh and eighth grade. In, in fifth and sixth, they kind of still have that homeroom uh, model where they have the teacher who's at kind of acts as an advisor, but but in seventh and eighth grade, um, really trying to have some common experiences across a grade level, across advisory, where there's group building, team building. Uh, kinds of activities, but there's also some of our school counselor work is happening as part of the advisory, and we have a group of, of people who are very interested in integrating the WESLA work into into that advisory. So it's it's really about you know tackling some of the the social emotional issues, but promoting student leadership. What are some topics and and ideas that advisors want to be discussing with with their their students? Um, we've trying to build in a community service piece to that as well. So um, students go out and do trail work, they might do some charity work, they do work with local soup kitchen and things like that. So it's it's um, needs some more, you know, refinement. I think we're going to continue adding and building on it, but I think a big first step was really just building it in as a daily piece of our of our master um, schedule and then now that we have that time and, and structure we can continue to build on it and the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, just for a little more elaboration on was your was the conversations you said you've been having with with student leaders can you give us a sense of what kinds of what kinds of feedback you're getting from student leaders in the school are they accustomed to having those conversations or are those new conversations and what what sorts of things are they telling you um, they're, uh, it's great when they meet, when we, they're very assertive, <laughs> um, and uh, assertiveness is, is a great skill, um, and it's appropriate, it's polite, but they have um, a lot to say and a lot to offer, and I think the more we can continue tapping that, um, they have a lot of great ideas, and um, I think we're really trying to raise up student voice into a lot of what we do. We've asked for opinions about the schedule, we've asked for, um, and they've openly shared what kinds of experiences are you having in school? Do you feel challenged? Is it engaging? Um, are, are there times you feel where you're not being engaged? What kinds of things would you like to see in the schedule? Tell us about the, the advisory experience, um, you know, and things like that. They're, they're very good about bringing things, but we can also ask questions and, and have a conversation with them. You know, part of, they've, they've asked about bringing in the speakers um, as a, a, a kind of an annual request. They always want to have more dances but, uh, and things like that, which is, which is great and understandable too. But um, we have some students who have come forward and they want to be a part of creating a maker space at, at our middle school. So you may have heard something about that and we have some support from CIF on getting that going. But I really feel with a, a few staff members and some student um, supporters that that's largely going to contain a lot of student empowerment and voice and I think they're going to be key in the design and build of that that space as well. Great well we're excited to have a, a student initiated uh, policy change on our agenda tonight which we'll get to later. Oh that's great. Um, thank you for the, this all this update it's really exciting to hear all this all the work that's going on at the middle school. Great thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Any other takers? Sure. Thank you. Welcome, Jeff. I think it makes, it makes sense for me to go next because some of what I say piggybacks very directly on what Mike was just talking about, particularly the Wessler training of trainer things. I'm thinking that board members may have gotten a copy of a memo. OK, um, so I'm not going to go through all of these things, but there's just a few things that I wanted to highlight. Um, 
Proficiency-based grading, when we originally wrote the strategic plan, that appeared that it was going to be in full force um, applicable to our current ninth graders. And then after we wrote that version of the plan, uh, we got an extension from the state about that. So we are continuing. There are teachers who are, con who are piloting some aspects of proficiency-based grading, and we are doing some behind-the-scenes work. Um, but really, the extension has allowed us, um, similar to what Mike talked about at the high school, to sort of back up and do some of the foundational work, particularly related to curriculum writing. Um, our student intervention team, which relates to Initiative 2, um, is, is having a, a more precise focus this year. I think we are working through our process and trying to figure out what's wor what works best for us. Uh, the particular group of students we've tended to spend the most time on this year because I think it tends to be an indicator of students who have any number of issues um, behind, um, it's, it's the issue of student chronic absent, absenteeism because um, that often is at the high school level at least an indicator of either stress um, or students being academically over, overwhelmed or emotional issues or things like that. So most of our meetings we've actually been targeting some students who are facing those issues and we'll continue that later this week. Um, as I mentioned, we are spending time on writing curriculum. Um, teachers are working in teams. Um, my expectation that we talked about from the beginning of the year is that every teacher is part of a team writing a curriculum in collaboration with at least one other teacher in a class that they commonly teach uh, for at least one course um, and to develop that curriculum by the end of the year also following an understanding by design template or templates that are based on understanding by design elements. Um, in fact, this Friday after the student early release, our teachers will be continuing to do that work. Um, and as Mike said, that is foundational for proficiency-based grading. It is actually foundational to our NIAS work, and it's foundational to a professional learning community work. So it really is the intersection point for a lot of things. Um, and then the goal about creating an inclusive and supportive district culture, again, there is some significant overlap uh, between what what's happening at the middle school and the high school. Um, so Steve Wessler came in and, and part of the team that was being trained uh, were middle school staff members and parents and part of the other part of that group were um, high school um, staff members. Um, so actually the week after the break, um, we are gonna be starting um, uh, having the staff members who are trained go off and training students. Um, so Nate Carpenter, the assistant principal, is actually meeting with a large number of students tomorrow to sort of bring them into that fold and bring them up to speed about that. Um, we also did start an advisory program this year. It's based in um, our achievement period. Um, and it is the way we structured it this year with the support of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation who gave us a generous grant to do some training of teachers. Um, about a new role as an advisor, which is really quite a different role, is that we made a deliberate decision this year because of all the things that we've all heard about stress, um, particularly once you get to the high school level, but perhaps even before, we made a fairly deliberate decision to not include any programmatic elements to our advisory program at all, um, at least at the outset. We may evolve towards a more uh, programmatic sort of element within the advisory program, but it's really more about getting to new, know students and informally interact with students than any program. Um, so almost all the staff members in the high school um, have an advisory group. Um, I have one, Jeff Thorick has one, a lot of folks, a lot of folks have advisory groups. Um, I think they've been fun. We are beginning to gather information from students um, and we'll do that shortly after the break, uh, having a brief survey about what their experience is. Um, my guess is it's like anything else. It sort of depends on the particular group and it sort of depends on the advisor. So we'd like to sort of tease that out a little bit. Um, but it has been a fairly informal um, for example, one of the staples of my advisory group, well, there are two staples of it from the beginning of the year. One is sort of going around and doing a high, quick high-low. You know, what's, what was your high of this past week? What's your low of this past week? That's one thing, and our group has a bunch of kids who are really competitive in, in um, 
uh, categories as well. So we've been playing categories periodically in my advisory group, as well as. I'm going to hit pause right here. So you are actually taking on your own advisory group. Yeah, I love it. And yes, wow. it's great. It's great. Okay, just um, want to make sure I was hearing you. There are only a, the, the folks who are not doing advisories are Nate Carpenter, the assistant principal, is not only because I think it's important to have some administrative presence around the building, and <laughs> the, uh, the social workers are not. And the idea with them is that it allows them to do some consulting with kids during that period, and, and also some consulting with um, staff members who are advisors to sort of help them develop a comfort level around that role. Um, and the nurse is not doing, but with that exception, virtually every professional educator in the building is, is an advisor for a group of students. Um, and I think that's probably it um, in terms of the things that I want to, I'd like to highlight and I'm glad to answer any questions anybody has. Um, years ago you had said your goal was, one of your goals was to have every student have an adult in the, in the school that right. they can make contact with right. and go to and this looks like it's the avenue to get there. That's exactly. Yep. That's our hope. And, and um, Mike did the, the main integrated youth health survey yesterday. We're doing it Thursday. Um, and there are questions on that that deal with precisely that question. Um, and then I believe the, sur the online survey that we're doing as well um, by grade level also has similar questions. So we'll mm -hmm. pretty quickly begin to tease out if we're making progress. And I'm sure at the beginning, um, not everyone filled out the survey um, as honest as they can, and therefore I think, I think mm -hmm. our kids are usually pretty. Oh, honest. good. Oh, good. They're anonymous. Great. They're anonymous surveys, great. so I think the kids will be pretty honest. That's great. I can actually speak on a professional level. The validity of the main integrated youth health survey has actually been found to be quite standardized, especially since it's been in place now for, this will be its fourth cycle. Great. Yeah. That's great. I said one thing. It's not so much of a question as a request, I guess. It would be really helpful to us now that you have the extension on proficiency-based diploma. If you and Meredith and Ruth Ellen and your assistant could kind of revamp those areas of the plan to play it out now over the time you have to work with mm -hmm. Jeff, yep. so it'll be clearer to us about what you hope to accomplish sure. each year as you pave the way for this through them. And it would affect Mike's, some of Mike's goals in the, in the five-year plan as well, just so, just so that's clearly reflected. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You. Welcome, Kelly. So while well, Mike and Jeff are getting them to be career and college ready, we're getting them to be middle school, high school, career and college ready. So, um, so uh, we have exciting things to share. Uh, we've been busy, busy, busy at Pond Cove. Um, I'm going to just go chronologically, but I will just um, really touch on the highlights. Um, on goal one, and ensuring opportunities for the success of all students by providing a high quality and, and comprehensive instructional program. A big emphasis, as you know, that started last year was our writing curriculum um, out of Teachers College. And uh, we have been, uh, we have completed the, um, the informational and narrative genres in terms of how we're measuring their success pre and post. We are in the process of, of working on the, opi the opinion genre. And there's a typo in, I think, one of your, um, the, the, the long one, it says by summer 2016, it should say summer 2015. Um, we're seeing some really exciting writing from our students, um, so we're, we're really, really encouraged by um, how well that program is working and how it's aligning with the Common Core State Standards for us. For our art, aligning our RTI and our student support team and intervention work, uh, we're very excited about how our SST, our student support team process, is becoming much more data-driven. So we're looking really critically at what is the data telling us about the students and how we're measuring them and how successful they're being and who do we need to really focus in on so that we can really prioritize the students who really have, are showing some achievement gaps and how can, we, how can we bridge those. And to that end, we're also 
looking at our, very, very closely at our assessments. We have a lot of assessments, as all of you have gone through, had uh, young children have gone through, and you know how many assessments we have. And what we've decided is, and have recognized, is that we can winnow down those. We don't need, we can really just do some progress monitoring with specific assessments. And now that we have STAR, the universal screener, that is helping us in a broad-based way. But when we really want to look diagnostically and see what we need to do to, to do more progress monitoring for specific students on a more incremental basis, um, so that we can then do interventions that are going to be meeting those students' needs more regularly and not just wait for a length of period of time to do that. Um, we're no longer um, taking that model. So that's, that's been going really well for us, but we continue to improve upon that. In terms of implementing differentiated instructional practices to meet the diverse learning needs of all students, we're, we're noticing we're, as we're going through walkthroughs and we're goal setting with, with our teachers, Julie Nickerson, our assistant principal, and I are doing more goal setting. We're, we've divided the staff, so continuing contract staff. We're goal setting with every single one of them based on what they see their needs are professionally and where they want to grow. And we're also where we can give some coaching aside, like you may want to look, read this and do this, and we're getting in and giving them more systematic feedback. But we're, we're also looking at to see what are some of the differentiated instructional practices that they can be doing. And many times they're doing things they don't even recognize. We had a wonderful um, team meeting today with first grade. Amy Kieran was bringing back something that she had just um, learned at a workshop. And another teacher said, oh, you're teaching up. And someone said, well, what's that? And so it was really exciting to see that she, the types of instruction that teachers are starting to use, they're recognizing that we don't just need to do some side of the pool work with the students who we think just, they're not quite ready for prime time on this. Everyone is ready for prime time. We just need to recognize how the entry points where they need to get and how we get them. So everyone, as Caroline Tomlinson, our differentiated instruction guru says, respectful teaching is really the way that we need to make sure that every student is eligible and every student deserves to have engaging, highly exciting, teaching opportunities, teaching and learning opportunities to get there. They just may get there in a different way. Um, when we're looking at um, the risk of school failure and what are we doing to improve the access for education for all those students, um, obviously implementing full day kindergarten is going enormously well, um, fully implemented. And how I think we can really tell how well it's going is independently is when you can have your, most of your kindergartners put on a snowsuit independently. Okay, we've seen a lot of that right now. Okay, so when they come swish, swish, swishing down the hall, um, having zipped up on their own, having gotten their boots, we know that there's a lot of success happening there. And that's just a light note of that. But it is a really big indicator of how well it's going. Um, when, with regard to aligning existing and developing curricula with main learning results standards, grade level teams have been working on math curriculum alignment, and that is the goal for um, a lot of them are doing it this right now, but also this coming Friday, the early release day, that is going to be devoted to that. Um, in terms of the um, it, Initiative and in, uh, the initiative six of implementing a curriculum cycle for review and development of district curricula. What we're, what we're doing is we're looking at um, we're taking the um, Smarter Balance Digital Library that some of us went to a training for that. And what that is is it's an, it's it's put up by Smarter Balance, but it's an ev evidence based clearinghouse of resources uh, that include assessments and performance tests to help, and it's K-12, so it's not just focused on the, the grade levels that are going to be taking the Smarter Balance Assessment. It's also for, it's for K-12, so it's aligned with the Common Core State Standards, but it gives some incredible resources that are na that come nationwide, and they're evidence-based, so they've been tested. It, it's not just random, um, and, and that's, we've been, um, giving access, all the teachers have access to that and um, have started using that. Obvious, and goal two, expanding the learning opportunities for all students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture. I know that you know our Peace Upon Cove initiative, um, we take that very seriously. And so what, what we've added this year, we're pretty excited about. Um, our student support team, uh, m what we're doing on a monthly basis is we are having our experts down the hall and um, come in and work with our student support team on different topics that have to do with social and emotional growth that will help integrate 
um, how successful they are being in the classroom. So like, for example, tomorrow, for, and the, this is before school, and all teachers are invited, and I can't tell you how many, how many come to this. I mean, so it's really, it, it really speaks volumes to the commitment of the staff. So tomorrow, it, um, the focus is going to be anxiety in the classroom. And so that's going to be presented with our social workers, our school counselors, social workers Faith Barnes and Deb Hannon and um, Bree Gallagher. And another one that we've had this year, Alina Perez um, presented on how, to, how teachers can recognize early what could be some indicators of learning disabilities in the classroom. And obviously, the recognizing of that is, is essential in terms of whether or not there's a refer, you know, referrals are made or what types of strategies we use for interventions. But it broadens the awareness to make sure that teachers know that this is not, this, these are all of our, all our children. And so the inclusiveness has to be also in the classroom. It's not just dependent upon the experts to take them out. Um, another, another one that was very, um, very popular that was really helpful was, uh, for, for many teachers, was supporting students with autism in the classroom so that we make sure that we can be inclusive and not just on helping teachers, but what, what are some strategies that teachers can use to help other students who do not to not present with certain with certain disabilities, and how can we help those children too? Because if we're not if we're not helping our students um, with their social emotional growth in the classroom, obviously we're not going to be helping them with their cognitive growth as well. So that that's pretty exciting. Um, we also um, to the end of social emotional development and the well-being of students. Um, we're doing this particular month. We're doing a, a kindness promotion. And um, Brie Gallagher is working with all K-4 classrooms on, on a um, kindness initiative. And it's really about being kind but not expecting um, some kind of reward for that. So it's really being, it's kind of like that silent, doing these kind deeds um, and acts of kindness without the expectation that someone, someone's going to say, good job, I'm glad you just picked up that pencil for, some, for your friend. So those are the kinds of things that are happening ar around that realm. We have also instituted a quiet lunch area. We have a huge cafetorium, as you know, and for students who we think the, is a little bit overstimulating on certain days or certain weeks and sometimes more, they can bring a friend, they, we have a quiet lunch area that is in another part of the, we actually have an extra room, and so it, that's worked out really well. Um, for goal three on um, increasing student engagement in learning and teacher engagement in instruction, um, at, particularly under initiative two, the strengthening our community connections by developing and sustaining partnerships with local individual businesses and organizations to reinverse the learning of 21st century skills in and out of the classroom. Obviously, the 250th anniversary project, grades K through four, we have, we have ex really exciting projects that you'll be learning more about. I won't go into them now. I, I know I've mentioned them in the past, but um, thanks to CEIF in particular and the PCPA, we've gotten some funding for just about every grade level um, to do these really exciting projects. We also have a continued partnership with the Land Trust. Um, lots of opportunities for winter walks. The, the first grade has been telling us all the footprints that they've been finding, um, thanks to all the fresh snow each time they've been going out the last couple of weeks. Um, obviously, our Robinson Woods um, continues. Um, Chiwanki outreach grants um, that have been provided generously by the Land Trust, and the Land Trust is also offers us their, um, their location to have the live animals um, there, which is wonderful. Thomas Morrow Library, we continue that connection there. Love, our, love the reader dogs. And we also have the Cape Elizabeth High School mentors um, that come regularly. Um, so that's been going really well. And then, for, as you know, Fort Williams has a new children's garden. Um, right now, it's, in, it's dormant um, and covered. Um, no winter kill going on right there right now. But um, we had a wonderful, it was on a weekend, but we had many children and families come out for a, a lasagna piling of, um, so we're pretty excited about um, continuing that. And then we are also looking at, um, for, Initiative three of providing staff with relevant and engaging professional opportunities um, aligned with district goals and uh, to improve student educational experiences. We have a lot, in terms of book groups, what we've decided is working better for us this year is instead of, instead of having just regular book groups and you sign up, is really being very strategic and targeting what we need and particularly um, 
for third and fourth grade and preparing them for the Smarter Balanced Assessments coming up. We've done a lot of work with those grade levels with um, particular professional literature around teaching critical vocabulary that's necessary. Um, so we have some, we, a couple of books and I'm happy to give you more information about them if you want more. Um, another one that we we're using is called Rigorous Reading, Five Access Points for Comprehending Complex Texts so that um, they're learning more about close reading. And with kindergarten, full day kindergarten, we, we feel blessed that we have six extraordinary kindergarten teachers, but we're also looking at full day, what are some of the elements that we, we, can, we can explore further to make it an even richer experience for our kids. So we have one particular book that we really like called K Today, Teaching and Learning in the Kindergarten Year. And that's an edited version, so it's by lots of different experts. Um, professional development, we have, um, if you're ever having a bad day, come over and see Tom Chaltray, our um, tech integrator, who's never in a bad mood. Um, and if he is, then we're really worried. Something's really wrong. Um, he offers Tech Tuesdays on many of the Tuesdays before school, 7.45 to 8.30. And he's done everything from helping teachers develop new websites to teaching them how to do more blogging, um, to help with communication, to uh, home school communication, to teaching them new apps. And as you know, um, He's been having, um, he and the tech team, I need to give all of them credit. Um, we had very successful Coder Express in December, and um, last week we had the Google Apps for Education for grades two through four, and he's also in the process of planning one for um, grades K and one on using different apps on the iPad. Um, and I think I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, so any questions? I know I've talked kind of fast, but John. Kelly, uh, one of our um, key indicators of success is, is the, the number of students who report feeling connected or well supported by, a, by an adult in the schools. This seems particularly critical at the Pond Cove level. What, are you, do you have specific um, initiatives that you're using to, to increase the level of engagement? I mean, I, I know it's, it's very high at well, Pond Cove, but yeah. um, how do you prevent kids from, you know, feeling lost or, or falling through the cracks? We, um, one thing we do is we have something called silent mentors. I mentioned about the students um, doing some, some of the older students, or maybe I didn't mention this. We have older students who are connecting with younger students, but for adults, we have something we call silent mentors, and they, students don't even really know that they have this mentor, but it's, um, we, we have recommendations from teachers and um, of these students could use an ex some extra TLC, some extra attention. And I think I've mentioned it, um, I think I mentioned it years past, something we called, it's an acronym for HUG, but it's not a HUG, um, H-U-G, so it's hello, update, goodbye. So students coming in the door might say, hey, Michael, you know, how, how was your weekend? You know, did, you know, did, you know, how was your, how, you know, did you play soccer this weekend? And, you know, and, and if, you know, and if he says, yeah, yeah, you know, how'd your game go? Oh, I won. Oh, that's great. You know, hey, great. Have a good day. If he's like, oh, no, no, I didn't have a good weekend. Then it might be, hello, update. Update, goodbye. You know, gee, what happened? You know, you know oh, we lost the game. I, I'm, just, I'm just not a good player. I can't do it. And then we know we have to, we have to do some more, you know, some more intervention in terms of giving, making more of those connections. Um, Another thing, that, another thing that we're doing is, is um, like for students who are new, and we have, we had, we had, we had a lot of new students come in um, January and this month, um, February, for, um, we, and Brie Gallagher does this every, um, for all new families, but she makes a point of having lunch with all of them and making sure that there's connections. We also try to, when parents are calling, right now parents are calling and saying they're looking at moving to Cape Elizabeth next year and what, you know, what kind of connections can Good. they make. And so we, we're very accommodating it with the permission of families on if you want to have us help you make a connection with a family that lives in your neighborhood or somebody that is your, the same age as your, as your child, we do those kinds of things as well. So it's, it is something, and we, we watch for those indicators in class. It's, it's usually... Sometimes it could be acting out, but it's, it's, it's more, more often the child who's really, really quiet um, right. that isn't really reaching out. <coughs> we, have to, we know if they're in the playground and the periphery, they're not connecting, and so people will. We, we, meet, we meet weekly as well. We, 
we don't really have a, quite a name for it, but we kind of call it our guidance group, and it's Julie Nickerson and me, and um, Aaron Taylor, our school nurse, Brie Gallagher, Dan <coughs> and Faith Barnes, our social workers, and we meet, and we, we really discuss, kind of like a medical model, we discuss if there's any students that, you know, we feel that we need to, um, we need to do some interventions for social emotional growth, we do that. Thank you. Sure. So I'm always concerned about the kindergarten, first and second grader who are struggling to learn to read because um, <coughs> some kids learn how to read, you know, come into kindergarten reading and other kids are on different paths. So I love, um, I'm sure you spend a lot of time with phonemic awareness and everybody knows the term and how to help the kids stay in the classroom with their peers. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you do for the kids who know they're in a different book group and know that they are not reading um, the same book in the same classroom? Well, one one big thing that I think is that's been a nice shift in the last in the last few years is there's a lot of nonfiction books now, um, and so that nonfiction is a huge huge piece of our reading programs. And so students, when we can seek out what their passions are. You often see they don't even they're not even paying attention to who's reading what they just want they want that alligator book they don't care what it is that kind of thing but we also do as you know we have both a pull out model and push in model so so teachers are coming in and the push in model can be seamless um, we also have um, Rosemary again who can come in and you know is doing some coaching um, with teachers and helping with that as well so it's it's not we don't have the um, the, the model of the reading groups, it's really more one-on-one. -on -one. It might be two-on-one -on -one sometimes, depending on the strategy that the student need, students need or the interest level of a particular book. Um, but it's, it's a lot more seamless than, I would say, I like to say the old days. Yeah, yeah is it like three years, two years? <coughs> How are we shifting more to the... Is yeah, it's it's push in. Yeah, it's been. I mean, it's 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 both. Um, sometimes, I mean, you know, the student is benefiting more without having a distraction around. You know, that's, you know, that, you know, and we just have to make that decision about you know the the style, the learning style of the child, and the needs of the child. Thank you. But questions. Are there any other questions? If I can stop coughing, I would just say thank you for the 250 efforts for the anniversary committee. We want to be sure to acknowledge when you might have a dramatic production or an unveiling of a mural uh, in, the, in the big timeline that will be going out to everyone. So that'll be exciting to know, Kelly. We have <laughs> kindergarten is making um, with our art teacher, wonderful art teacher, Mary Jane Johnson. They are making a gigantic birthday cake on wheels. Okay, so we're hoping this is going to be in some kind of um, parade. You know, we're thinking Family Fun Day. We're thinking, um, so I, I'm not sure how big it's going to be, edible? okay? <laughs> um, and um, first grade has a marine educator coming from um, what's called Coastal Encounters out of Wells. Um, Carol Steingarter is her name. She's doing, um, she's coming in with a live touch tank to do that. And then following that is Sarah. Herbal Simer, who is an artist in residence, who's they're going to be actually making, they're learning about the history of um, Portland Headlight. They're constructing one for the lobby and then making, from what they learned from the marine educator, a um, a tide pool, a multimedia tide pool. That will be unveiled actually on Arts Day, which is May 29th. Um, the second grade is going to be doing poetry um, around special landmarks and people, places, um, and they're, they're, their plan is to be working with John Holdridge, um, who they worked with, they had a lot of work with him when, they, when he was at the telling room as well. Um, and that, that decision hasn't been made yet when those unveilings will be. The plan, the, the hope is that they would be displayed around the town during the anniversary year, so that's kind of exciting. Um, third and fourth grade, right following um, April vacation, they are working with artists in residence, Gretchen Burke Physical Theater, that is going to be the fourth grade, primarily with Gretchen, and working with um, Lori Downey, who is making, makes these, does the local stories project with Gretchen, making big mural. Um, and it's really up to the students and how they're gonna design the mural. It could be one gigantic mural, it could be panels of murals, and so the 
plan for the installation when Gretchen Berg has, there will be six performances for the six fourth grades, um, and they have, the students have to decide, so I can't tell you what it's about yet. I mean, I know it's about Cape Elizabeth, that's all I know about. Um, but they, they will, the plan is to have the unveiling of the mural um, the same time that the public performance is, will be for the um, fourth grade. And also the plan, we're, we're trying to see if, if we can make it work with the, um, the night at the light in the summer in July, um, the big celebration with the Portland Symphony Orchestra for the 250th Committee, we're going to see if it's possible if the fourth grade could, can perform that same night um, in the summer. So we've got big plans, but we just don't, we, gotta, we have a few logistics to work out. I know we spent a lot of time on this, but I, uh, you know, this is exciting, obviously, to hear a lot of new activities. Um, but if I'm a teacher, it also sounds like a lot of incremental work. So one thing um, but I would encourage the principals also to include in their strategic planning updates. I don't know how often we use those, but what are we doing that we used to do? Because I know one constant feedback from teachers is they don't have enough time. So if we were doing the need we're doing an extra assessment where that's more time. So we know it's a, it is incremental work. So maybe as you think about what teachers need to do more of, also what can they do less of? Because um, you know the students are only there that many uh, amount of time. I don't need feedback. That's a suggestion. And another suggestion is obviously the teachers are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So maybe in a future meeting, you know, how are teachers? Um, views and feedback being reflected and refined because you know these are dates and we know it's aggressive and it's uh it may be too ambitious but that might be something for us to get confidence that teacher input is being heard and incorporated so i don't need responses but that might be something um that we've heard from some teachers that that might be valued and um, we would like to understand how that might be, be incorporated into the, you know, making this strategic plan work. So um, thank you for your time and also thank you for coming out after, uh, you know, the last few weeks you've had. So thank you. Thank you. That suggestion was for all three principals, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, actually, you hit the nail on the head as, as this particular section of our um, business meeting is has new and newly introduced um, now that we've sort of lived through it um, I, I would love to hear any key learnings about how this section has gone um, how to um, improve or, or continue parts of what we've heard tonight so that we can um, make our time together as efficient and useful as possible so I always like to circle back and, and sort of give the thumbs up or thumbs down or thumbs sideways. So if you have any comments or feedback about how this section of the agenda went, um, I know that you all know um, my email address as well as Meredith's. So thank you. Um, next up on our agenda are um, the school board goals draft. <clears throat> and when asked earlier, and I'm the one who even asked the question if there were any adjustments, <laughs> adjustments to this evening's agenda. I failed to say we don't have a draft of the goals ready to share. So um, we can just cross that off as done. Look at that. We're saving more time. <laughs> and that brings us to um, Section D, Planning Decisions Report. So I learned this afternoon that Rebecca from Planning Decisions wasn't able to join us tonight um, due to a scheduling challenge. So I'm going to do my best to give you kind of a brief summary of the... I don't know how many pages, 50-ish page report that's in your packet. Um, so again, just to give a little bit of background, um, Planning Decisions is a local company out of Portland that does sort of demographic work and predictions, and they work with a lot of municipalities and school districts around Maine. Um, and so they were asked this fall, uh, based on some enrollment uncertainty and some um, concern that there had been some changes in trends, to provide us with some information about the likelihood of enrollment changes and patterns in Cape Elizabeth. Um, why is enrollment important? Well, it drives a lot of the work that we do in schools. Uh, it's how we plan for staffing, it's how we plan for resources and supplies, and drives a lot of our budget work. 
Um, it's also how we maintain a small comprehensive high school and are able to offer, um, thank you Jeff for smiling, um, the variety of programs and experiences that we offer students. Um, it's also important to us because in Cape Elizabeth, two-thirds of our taxpayers right now don't have students in the schools. And so being mindful of that as we make decisions about resources and requests to the community is, is equally important. Um, so. I'm going to cheat and sort of steal pieces from the executive summary that I highlighted late this afternoon. Um, they were asked to look at a number of things. They, they typically include demographic information. So they look at birth rates, they look at um, historical enrollment information, they look at housing trends and housing turnover, um, new homes being built, all of those pieces. So they did that. Um, they looked at all of those factors and they came up with kind of two models. One is what they call the best fit model that's based on sort of historical enrollment and trends and data. And the other they've called the 20 new homes model, um, which is what, so that you sort of have two extremes. Um, one being, here's what we've seen over time. And if things continue the way they have, this is where you'll be. And the other being, if you get sort of the maximum number of homes being built that you've seen in this community over time. And again, they concentrated on the last five years specifically, but went back many years beyond that um, to look at data. Um, then this is what you'll get. And so, you know, for, for some years, that difference isn't very dramatic. Um, next year being one, the difference between the historical enrollment and, sorry that I'm <laughs> my visual learning, for those of you at home. Um, the historical enrollment in the 20 new homes model is only a difference of 18 students as you look district-wide for next year. But, but as you sort of play that out, it, that number grows over time. Um, next year, in the best fit model, you have a projection of 73 students coming in to kindergarten. In the um, 20 new homes model, you have a projection of 91 students coming into kindergarten. And so, uh, you know, as we make decisions about budget and resources and, you know, we're applying this already to our own sort of budget driver conversations, those are kind of the, the extremes that you see. And um, we obviously are right down the hall in our central office from the planning office in town, so we get to have conversations about, well, how many homes are being built right now? Um, again, this is new current data, so they've done their homework in, in sort of playing that out. Um, anyway, I guess that's my brief summary. Happy to answer any questions that I can or find out answers for you. Meredith, um, homeschool students and students go in and out of private school. They're both, um, they are, uh, they're in the best fit. Um, are they both? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say they really fit, are in both because historically we've always had students who are in homeschool. We've always had students who are attending private schools. You know, we have the new addition of charter schools, but again, that's sort of incorporated in recent um, year data as well. I, I mean, it's, you know, looking at the data, we can go through the drivers, but um, Given we budget on a yearly basis, you know, it, it might be nice to know what might happen in 24, 25, but from a budgeting perspective, it's not really helpful information. So, um, you know, given it's, you know, uh, you know, intuitive, we can say we'll probably have less students four years from now. Um, but from a budgeting standpoint, given, you know, we try to make our best estimate, or, or you do, for the upcoming year, uh, uh, um, you know, how could we really use this? Uh, I'm just thinking maybe in terms of, you know, resource utilization or building, um, you know, spending, you know, how many classrooms, but on a longer term basis, how, how might we use this? So I would say this data is really only accurate um, for the first three to five years out. You know, beyond that, it's sort of a best guess. But you can begin to look at, are these, are these trends holding true? Are we leaning more towards the best fit model or the 20 new homes model? Or are we somewhere in between? Um, you know, we've always used our own sort of local historical data as a predictor, and it has held true that that tends to be the best predictor. We've done sort of a five-year weighted average of what is our kindergarten enrollment or, or, excuse me, first grade enrollment look like based on our kindergarten data. And those projections have held pretty true. We've looked at sort of our average number of students who leave between eighth and ninth grade. Um, and we have a five-year weighted average for that. And again, those projections have held pretty true. So um, I, again, I, I think it's useful in giving you sort of the larger context of you know, sort of what's going on and trends that you might want to watch for. Remember that um, Maine is the oldest state in the United States right now in terms of population and, and birth rate is declining 
statewide. It's not only a Cape Elizabeth issue. Um, so it's important for us to sort of be mindful of this trend and pay attention to sort of what's happening to the economy, what's happening with housing, what's happening with birth rates, um, and continue to sort of focus in on what are we seeing right now in our schools. Thank you. So just to reiterate um, some of the findings, and again, the, this packet, this report can be found. It's online. It was online originally with our um, postponed workshop due to snowstorm at the end of January, and it's, I believe, posted again online with tonight's agenda materials. Um, so just to recap and, and see if I'm understanding and hearing you correctly, when I'm looking at, for instance, page 18, um, the 2014-2015 best fit model <clears throat> projections for next year is um, 73 students coming into kindergarten, um, which is a significant drop from previous years um, of almost 20 students. And then looking at the other type of projection, which would be the 20 new homes added, mm -hmm. um, it's also projecting a drop, but not as significantly, of 10 students to 91 students a year. <clears throat> the truth, I'm sure, lies somewhere in between. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions or comments about the report? As always, this is a lot of information to digest. Um, if anyone has any questions or concerns about the report, please email myself or Meredith, and we will try our best to answer your questions and concerns. I do know that we will be using this report um, on the school board in, in reviewing our upcoming budget to ensure that we are um, meeting the best needs of the students in our district, as well as calculating, because the other part of this is what our district receives eventually for State okay. Okay, seeing none. Um, we're moving along at lightning speed now to um, 5E, the superintendent's report. Okay. So snow is the name of the game around here. Um, we have had a number of interrupted days, whether cancellations due to snow, delays due to snow, early releases due to snow. So I want to just thank our bus drivers um, and our public works folks and our transportation director and dispatcher who are you know, up taking calls from me at you know, 4.30 in the morning as we um, try to make decisions about how to move forward with the day. Um, they're not always clear-cut decisions, as you know, most of you woke up this morning with four inches of snow outside your door, and we were supposed to get a dusting. Um, so Barbara was just telling me she really missed those dusting. <laughs> I'm happy to add you to my call list, Barbara, if that would be helpful. Um, I have had some, I'm used to. <laughs> I, I get um, lots of um, suggestions and feedback now from students, which is a great thing. So if you worry about student voice, it is alive and well, I promise you, um, with lots of creative suggestions about how to handle the weather um, that comes before <coughs> us. So I'm happy to always send replies to those. Um, uh, though I will warn you that if you send me enough, you might be on the 4.30 a.m. call list. <laughs> so be careful what you wish for. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Our food service program went through uh, their state audit last week, and I want to just commend Peter Esposito, our food service director, um, school nutrition director, and his staff for their work um, on that. We have a great food service program, and meeting with a reviewer from the state at the end of the day, she had a lot of praise for the work that's going on in the district. and. Um, you know, that with the changing changes that we have experienced in nutrition guidelines and um, regulations and the fixed price on meals, you know, it's difficult to um, develop as many um, homemade products as we do. In fact, one of the pieces of feedback from the woman from the state was, don't you have labels for some of these things? And I said, well, no, because we make them. Um, and so that's not true in every district around the state. So I think that's something um, for folks to be proud of and to acknowledge. Um, it doesn't cost less, and the fact that our program is self-funding is um, also unusual um, in this economy and in this state. So um, I'm again, sure we have plenty of white of potatoes on the menu. <laughs> No comment. There is a, a lot of work that goes on behind. Limited, actually, because there are very specific uh -huh. carbohydrate guidelines that govern that. Um, so, congratulations to them. Uh, we had 
two competing events a couple of weeks ago, the Google Apps for Families Night at Pond Cove and the National Forensic League Speech and Debate Night at the high school. Wow. And um, you know, I, I only got to one of them, uh, but I was able to attend the speech and debate tournament that was held here a few weeks earlier. And um, again, a lot of work goes into those preparations and performances on the part of students. They're, um, participating in the state tournament very soon, so I want to wish them well as they move forward and represent our district and themselves. And um, Tom Schaltre, Pond Coast Technology Director, worked with the Cape Elizabeth E-Team, um, the high school, and other district technology staff to pull together the Google Apps for Families Night with great support from his Pond Cove colleagues, and there's, a, again, another good turnout for that, and lots of laughs and smiles, and um, parents learning from children, which is also a positive thing. We had a training, oh, dates are a blur now, um, a week or two ago with Dr. Mahesh Sharma. Dr. Sharma uh, is a math um, expert and he has traveled around this country, he runs a center um, in Massachusetts for math learning. Um, I had the opportunity to work uh, with him in my district a number of years ago in New Hampshire, but he is um, very experienced and uh, math teachers here seem to really enjoy the day with him. And um, again, just thinking about how do we meet the needs of kids where they are and really build their foundational math skills so that they're ready for higher level math learning. The TEDx Youth videos, um, Mike mentioned Speaker Hunter Kent from the high school, but those videos are now available online. If you go to the high school webpage or search our district site, they will be easily found. Um, and they're worth watching. I would encourage you to, on a snow day, you have nothing better to do, take a little time and check out those student videos. Um, kindergarten registration is open. As you hear, we're not sure what our numbers are going to be, so if you have a child who will be entering, please um, contact Pond Cove and let them know. The middle school will hold its career fair on March 5th, 7.30 to 9.45 a.m. It's Gail Schmader's farewell career fair event, so um, looking forward to um, that as always, but we always get a great turnout from um, parents and community members and business people from around the area who um, come and share their expertise with students. And on May 6th, our high school sophomores will be attending the South Portland Career Fair. South Portland Cape Elizabeth Community Chamber of Commerce puts that on in conjunction with South Portland Schools, and our students will be attending um, this year for the first time, which is great. Our substitute training is scheduled for Thursday night, February 12th, so stay tuned for weather reports. It doesn't seem to have worked in our favor, um, but that will be at 6.30 at the Middle School Learn Library Learning Commons. Our um, parent night for on differentiated instruction, um, also canceled for snow, has been rescheduled to March 18th, and Dr. Michael Shackelford will be there to answer parent questions and share a little bit about what the philosophy is behind differentiation. On March 16th, um, our robotics coordinator, Evan Thayer, is putting together a maker celebration. And I, no, I can't promise you what the location is, so stay tuned for that update at the March meeting. We have 54 authors and illustrators confirmed for AuthorFest on April 11th, and we are working, um, our district LITS team is working in collaboration with Rachel Davis and the Thomas Memorial Library to plan that. And one of the pieces um, being worked on for that right now is 250 books worth reading, um, <coughs> as recommended by Cape residents to sort of recognize the 250th as well. So, uh, let's see. Opportunity Alliance, um, director contacted me recently to compliment the district on being one of the first district in the areas to, or being the first district in the area to address the issue of e-cigarettes e and vape pens. Um, it is a topic that is, as you know, a hot one. Um, I'll have to think and, later. <laughs> and so they um, had looked at our policy and just provided some feedback that they were you know, glad to see that it was being recognized and could they refer other districts to us if they had questions about the process? So oh, I, I, I know just that want we have to recommend some Jeff's work on that policy. He was the one who stumbled upon and came up with some great language for that. So I know we have some experts in the room. So um, that was good news. Um, I received news uh, a couple weeks ago that I was elected to the College Board Regional Advisory um, Panel to represent the state of Maine. So. Um, that's a great thing. It's uh, exciting to see the work that the College Board is doing around sort of moving away from 
um, some of the more traditional assessments that they have done to be really more focused on um, skills and away from pure content knowledge. Um, I think it, it reflects you know, the, the emphasis that we as a district have put into the work around our strategic plan and proficiency-based graduation. And so um, that's a good thing. That's an amazing thing. And finally, since we didn't have our budget workshop, I thought I would just highlight a few of the things that we factor in as we look at budget and move ahead. Um, mm -hmm. And so number one is state revenue. And this picture for state revenue this year remains, as it does every year, very ambiguous. Um, the governor's proposed budget adds money to the pre-K-12 education budget. But based on the anticipated cost of education, which are also rising, it raises the mill rate locally from $8.11 or 8.11 to 8.44. Um, which again means costs us more locally, we receive less in aid. Um, the Education Committee is also reviewing the Essential Programs and Services funding formula and contemplating some changes to how funds are allocated for that, including looking at professional development, whether or not funding should um, flow to schools that are receiving Title I funds, some, some other areas, including preschool. Um, given our decline in enrollment, um, we can anticipate that our overall general purpose aid is likely to decrease. Um, on the bright side, there is a bill for charter tuition. Um, we're expecting that charter school tuition is proposed to be funded at the state level rather than in the local budget. Um, whether or not that legislation will pass, though, remains to be seen. Though I'm, I'm sure our local representatives are, are hearing us now. Um, so we're expecting some time in February, though I'm not optimistic about that, to receive preliminary um, general purpose aid information. My guess is it likely won't be until March at the earliest. Um, <coughs> so let's about enrollment a little bit. Um, salaries, the teacher's contract um, is the um, only contract that we have a definite number for at this point, and that um, proposes a 2.5% increase for next year in addition to steps. Um, benefits, health insurance is um, the largest portion of our benefits cost, but that um, we don't know exactly um, yet and won't know in probably until April what the um, premium increases will be for health insurance. We do know for retirement that the local cost for teacher retirement is increased from 2.65% to 3.36% uh, in this budget. Energy, some good news there is that we were able to lock in oil prices for FY16 at about $1.15 below what we're paying in the current year. So that, that's good news for us. On the other hand, we know that our electricity is proposed to go up about 5%. So good and bad news. Um, CIP, we are anticipating our initial interest in bond payment in FY16 for our capital improvements plan bond to deal with the roofing and HVAC <laughs> projects that um, we worked through on the last couple of years. I'm not going to go into detail about that. <laughs> Spend a lot of time on it. Um, and then most importantly, our budget will remain focused around our strategic plan goals, and you've heard a lot about those tonight. Any I questions? A, I do have a question um, about the substitute training. Is that a new uh, implementation? Because I feel like I've never heard about it. And what is the purpose of it? I mean, it sounds like a great thing. I'm just wondering what the. It's twofold. Yeah. Um, we have heard um, uh, concerns about the depth of our substitute pool and whether or not we have enough experience. You know, whether or not we have enough people. We've also heard um, from a few of our subs that. Geez, sometimes I've walked into a place and not been exactly sure what was expected. Um, we do have a substitute training manual that's been around for a while. Um, we started a couple of years ago doing, um, well, three years ago, I guess, doing face-to-face -face interviews with all of our subs, and we share that responsibility among the administrative team. Um, so we sit with all of our subs for at least 15 to 20, you know, 15 minutes or so to get a sense of who they are, what their experience is, and where they're sort of best be matched in terms mm -hmm. of their skills. Um, and then you know, this was a way to sort of both help people understand what a substitute does, plus give them some tips and pointers on how to be effective in that role. So it's open to people who've never substituted before and who are interested in applying, and it's also open to people who are already subs in our system um, who just would like a little bit more feedback and expertise. And so um, our building administrators are um, providing that training as an orientation and information session. I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Meredith, on my to-do list, I wrote down, call Rebecca Millette about um, and advocating for the state to pass that charter bill, that um, the state picks up the charter bill. Do you suggest Rebecca? Do you suggest? 
Actually, so, may I make a suggestion? Yep. And, and that might be a conversation for our legislative liaison, Barbara, um, who's already been in the pipeline with other bills on um, educating Rebecca. So I think that's an excellent. I worked on this one previously as well. And the, the interesting thing is the opposition was around folks who don't want charter to fall off the radar as an expensive cost. But now that perhaps it's been shown how much it hurts local districts, there'll be a new <coughs> um, look at the full impact of that, of that cost as it hits us. So I'm happy to follow up on that. That is a great idea. Yeah. Um, any other questions, comments, praises? Fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. OK, on to item six, new business. Uh, may I have a motion to um, approve the Ponco Parents Association proposed 2015-2016 Portland Pirates fundraising marketing materials in accordance with the school board policy for advertising? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, even though I think you did it. Um, I move that we approve the pond, uh, PCPA's proposed 2015-16 Portland Pirates fundraising marketing material in accordance with school board policy KHB advertising. Second. Second. All those in favor? To... Oh, we need to discuss it's... first. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh. <laughs> I'm all about the end game. Any discussion? May I just briefly explain um, what this is? Our, the Punco Parents Association um, proposed to us back in December, and unfortunately, our policy requires explicit school board approval. Um, the idea of, and photos are included in your packet, but they had worked with the Portland Pirates to sort of promote a family night at um, the Pirates, and they wanted, the Pirates wanted to use in the marketing materials a picture of their mascot in front of Punco School and standing next so to the sign. The and, um, and thank you. You're welcome. And so, so um, we weren't able to get that done in time for this year's event, but they're hopeful that they'll be able to use the information moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so included in your packet are pictures of, is it Salty Pete? Yes, it is. Right? Um, in front of the Pond Cove and Middle School signs, and because they do use um, likeness of our school's name and logo. We needed to run that, um, the use of Salty Pete as a business icon um, before the board. Any questions or concerns? No, nope, seeing none. Um, all those in favor? Okay. We thank the patients with the Banco Parents Association to process that through. And thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, may I have a motion in regards to the class of 2015 project graduation fundraising? Yeah, I move uh, we approve the class of 2015 project graduation committee fundraising efforts in accordance with school board policy procedure DFR fundraising. A second. All those, oh, I'm gonna help off. Any discussion, questions? I know that we have some representatives here from Project Graduation. So again, just briefly, um, our policy requires that board approve any fundraising that exceeds $20,000. Project Graduation fundraising has started before now, but as they sort of near that threshold, it's typical for them to come before the board and um, just vet that request. So there are representatives here if there are questions. Any further comments, questions? I guess I've got a slight question. If I'm being asked to approve their efforts, I should know what their efforts are, and I don't know what their efforts are, so I'm not sure why we have a motion. They are here. Um, would anyone from Project Graduation like to come up and fill us in on what some of your efforts have been? No? I, <laughs> Trish? I don't. I, I don't think we're, we're not being asked to approve their efforts, are we? We're being asked to approve. That the fundraising it's exceeds. It's the fundraising the efforts is in the motion. Their effort to exceed, right. So uh, I don't know that we need to know exactly how they're, I mean, maybe, maybe David does, but I would say the, the question for the board is, do we want project graduation to be fundraising in excess of, of $20,000 uh, $20, or, or not? 
Um, and I, I, I guess uh, I see project graduation as having been a, a successful way of providing an end of the year, end of, end of high school celebration for students in a safe, um, in a safe manner for many years. It's a, it's a, a well understood uh, program that's been successful and, um, and uh, I want to thank everybody who's involved in that fundraising and wish them well. As a previous member of the Project Graduation Fundraising Committee, I can give you a very brief overview. Um, many of the activities um, have included um, Project Graduation Nights at local restaurants like Ellesmere coming up or Otto's Pizza. Um, there have been um, solicitations to local businesses to help parents give this as a gift. Um, to their, their students within the district and um, in the hopes of defraying the cost for those families within the district who um, we hope for 100% participation on this incredible last night together. Um, to date, they have raised nearly $20,000 um, and their overall expenses are expected to be approximately $26,000. Um, but there has been previous seed money that have offset some of that need for them. Yeah, I think we approve this every year, so we should probably just vote on it. All right. Any other questions or concerns? I mean, I changed the, the phraseology of the motion and say we approve that they, um, uh, their fundraising may exceed the sum of $20,000. All right, I'll, I'll amend my motion. I move that we approve the class of 2015 Project Graduation Committee fundraising in excess of $20,000 in accordance with school board policy procedures DFR. Second. And I would note that there is a protection in here that all fundraising activities has to be approved by the building administrator. So it's not like we have to approve everything, unlike some other things. All these have to be approved by the building administrator. So I think that's a better motion. There are, there are some checks and balances in place, correct. All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion in regards to approving the proposed class of 2015 graduation event itself? I'll, can, yep, I move that we approve the proposed Class of 2015 project graduation trip on June 7, 2015, according to board policy IHOA field trips. Second. Second. Discussion? Now, this is an area in which we actually can't discuss. I just mentioned that to John. We're not supposed to say what it is. I know, and I'm already heading you off because this is a big secret. It's a gift of the parents no of the class of 2015. And I have been privy to some of the plans. They're kind of fun. Again, thank you to parents for um, making the time to take you, uh, send your children on this trip and uh, seeing it, it's important. It's a, a very emotional night and uh, great that our kids can be together at this last night as graduation. So thank you. It's also an event, quite frankly, that takes place so as, as a safety measure in terms of um, providing kids with an activity that's a little bit more structured and less fueled by substances we prefer not to be fueling it. So I, I think it's a great project. I, I would echo, David, and thank you. In 1981, I met one-on-one -on -one with 45 seniors to convince them to try this for the first time because that was a big change from the way we used to celebrate graduations. And there'd been a tragic accident with some Oxford Hills kids, mm -hmm. which started this whole movement in the state. So it mm -hmm. pleases me to no end that this is still a robust program for our kids. It's amazing when you think that this program mm -hmm. has actually started in the state of Maine and it is now celebrated exactly. across the country. So mm -hmm. we are innovative. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. May I have a motion in regards to the mock trial trip? I'll do this one. Oh, good. Thank you. I move that we approve. Uh, I move that we approve. To con David. I move that we approve. The mock trial trip. We Thank you. then say as attached <laughs> to the agenda. I, uh, I move that we approve the mock trial 
team trip to the National, uh, National High School Mock Trial Tournament in Riley, North Carolina, May 13th to 17th, 2015. Second. I, I second. Thank you. Um, questions, comments, discussion? David. Uh, just for full disclosure, since I'm not gonna vote on this, um, can't, I have to choose myself. Uh, there are going to be two coaches, myself and John Sarbeck, um, that the question, uh, this is an interesting question on this form, but it also ties into some of the policies we're doing. Where all members of the group have an opportunity to participate. The word participate is a little bit problematic because we're only allowed to field 12 kids, but a lot more go. So the word participate implies more, the answer is technically yes, we allow everybody to go that wants to, but they literally can't participate. They can only watch. So in the future we may want to play with that language a little bit, but everybody's been invited to try out, everybody's going to be invited to have a place, but we're limited by national mock travels, only allow seven people, and that's it. So Thank other than that, I think we, we comply with the, um, with the uh, reason for that sentence, but not the actual wording of it. You couldn't find anyone better than the former Attorney General to help you guys prep? Well, I, I didn't want to correct that. He's not an Attorney General. There's oh, only one. Okay. He's, he's an Assistant Attorney General, but she wanted to promote him. That's fine with me, but okay. he's not an Attorney General. Good to know. Any other comments, discussion? All those in favor? And John, um, David, I see you abstain. Thank you. May I have a motion in regards to the Nordic and Alpine ski team's trips to the Class B state ski meet? Press Kyle. Yes, I move we approve the Nordic and Alpine ski trip, uh, trip to the Class B state ski meet in Presque Isle, Maine, February 15th to the 17th, 2015. Second. Second. Discussion, questions? I can't wait to go to Presque Isle. All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you. Um, next is the, on our agenda is the 2015-2016 um, calendar for next year. Academic calendar, may I have a motion? I move that we approve the proposed 2015-2016 academic year calendar. Um, I know that we have had this on the agenda now for a few months in a row, discussing in particular at this point, we were waiting for some feedback from <clears throat> the Pond Cove community in regards to the additional five days um, in half days that are being proposed for their professional development. And um, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions and comments in regards to the information that Kelly provided us in regards to survey results and as well as the professional development plan. Yeah, maybe you should come up. Um, in particular, Kelly, I was wondering, I have a question. Um, in the packet, um, I think one of the things that we were hoping to see was a plan for how those days were to be used. Um, actually, we had, we had talked about that, and I'm going to actually um, refer to Michael's comment when he talked about getting input from staff. So what we, what we didn't do, I can give you examples of some, but what we want to do, um, we wanted to wait to see if it was approved. And then what we want to do is sit down with staff and really map out the year on how we want the best use of the time. Also based on when those days fall through the year, but some examples of how they would be used obviously would be for implement uh, unpacking standards, common core state standards, and how we're going to be preparing to make that shift. Um, one of the big pieces is um, we have to totally realign our, prog our progress reports. That's one piece, but really how we're going to be taking common core state standards across all curriculum. We also have a new gifted and talented program um, for all areas of the curriculum, essentially, just about, so that would be something. Another piece of that is how are we going to differentiate the professional development opportunities for, for we, talk about, we always talk about for students, but we have to do it also for staff. So we didn't, we didn't put down 
we could have put down examples, but we really wanted to have the opportunity to sit down with staff and really map out how we're going to use this. Some of them could be back to back. We might have a continuation into the next one. But because they're spread out through the year, we want to time it so that it, we can make the best use of that time to be whatever we're going to be implementing and have that um, front loaded and ready for that. Does that help as far as I can give you some more concrete examples, but in terms of being the specifics on what we're going to do on every one of those dates, I can't do that yet without the input of the staff. So. Is it my understanding that the request for the five additional half days, what came from your the staff? Right, so that they could use those days for, for professional development. But at the time, but they did not say, we did not say, when we had the meeting when initially with Meredith, it was not about we want to use the day in April for this, we want to use it for that. It would be to cover, it would be f focused on curriculum. They would all be focused on curriculum for the most part, but there could also be elements of it that are going to be on social emotional growth. But for the most part, we don't, because the time is fragmented on for the, um, the monthly staff meetings that we have and for team leaders meetings and for um, the weekly um, team meetings that we have there, as I mentioned before, they're 40, the allied arts time is 45 minutes, but by the time the teachers get, drop their students off and get back to the class, it's about 35 minutes. So this would be sustained professional development time that we would plan. And we certainly could give, we can give you that plan as soon as we have it. Um, but it would be, it, we, we need to have the input of the staff um, on how they best want to use it and then obviously make, you know, approve it. And we'd also want to be working pretty closely with Ruth Ellen Bond too on how, how that's going to align with the district's, um, the district's plan and obviously, you know, how it, how it also aligns with the strategic plan. So. The only part that's still confusing to me is they requested a specific number of days. I was wondering if they had had a specific idea in mind why five days and what they had expected to cover in those five days. I don't think there was a request for a specific number of days. It was a request right. for professional release days. Well, that's what I meant, a specific amount of time. So they had asked specifically for... Additional time. Additional right. time. Right. Okay. There was no specific amount of days. It was just, uh, say, it was once a month or um, throughout throughout the year. Okay. Um, but also looking at which which were the shorter months, like November's a short month. Um, we knew we we didn't need one in November. Those those types of. Um, I'm sorry, Barbara, and then John. I was just going to note, Kelly, that as I looked through this, the way this was adjusted with some of our suggestions from last time, there's actually either a professional day or release time monthly. So the whole district enjoys time in, in uh, the start of August before school. Right. Pond, and then the whole district has in October. Then Pond Cove would have a November, December. Then the whole district has January. And the whole district has February. And Pond Cove has right. March. So I think. What, what I would prefer to see is rather than just pulling out the four Pond Cove days, and I think there's only four now, is that there's a coherent plan for use period of district professional release time. And in addition, how Pond Cove would use that regular release that happens monthly to push their five year, five year strategic right. plan. Right. Interesting. John? Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused about the you, the, the two terms, curriculum work and professional development work. I guess what I thought I heard the last time we talked about this was the professional development piece. And now you're saying that those days would be used for curriculum work, which to me. Oh, same thing. I, I, I was just interchanging. Using them interchangeably? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry. To, to me, curriculum work is a different, it's, it's our regular work. Right, and this would give extended time for that. I mean, it, it, I, use it, I use it integrated. I mean, professional development for curriculum. So um, the professional development to enhance, obviously, the, the work that we're doing in curriculum. So I wasn't, 
I didn't mean to confuse anyone. Right. I mean, because to me, curriculum is, is the, the, the development, I may be way out of my league here, but it's the development of, of, of what it is that we want students to learn. That, when we're working on curriculum, that's to me what we're working on. And when we're working on professional de development, it's much more about the collaboration around our, what is our practice. Right. And I mean, I would say curriculum. To, to, I think I, I would say curriculum is both looking at the content and the delivery of that, and so that would go with, say we have, say, say for example, we're talking about math. So if it's math content, and say our focus is, on, say a particular, say it's fourth grade, is is really looking at what are the what are the um, common core standards around geometry. And so what does that mean for professional development needs around that? And that might mean how are we going to deliver instruction and, you know, to meet the need, to, to, to have every student meet the standard for particular standards within, say, geometry, measurement, um, any kind of, any of the concepts. And they could, cut because of the differentiation that's needed, what are the different types of models that we're going to need to use and what kind of professional development are we going to need to be focusing on to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all the students. So, so that, that leads me to ask is, is, would this be, do you view these five days, and I, I think it is five, I see five, five purple yes, days. Yes, you see five. Um, <laughs> do you view these five days as, as, um, yes. as an, uh, days that you would have at Pond Cove mm -hmm. each year moving forward, or is this just about developing curriculum as we adopt our yes. curriculum to, um, to common core standards? And, and it's something we would do yeah. through that transition process, but then after that, because it's curriculum work, it's not, it wouldn't be necessary in future years. Whereas well, professional development work is, that's, we're always doing right. that. That's, that's on, the ongoing work of collaborating in our practice. Well, I think, I think two things. I think one is the elementary school has the least amount of planning time than the three schools. I know we talked about that at the previous meeting. Um, I also think, I mean, this year, this coming year, and this, this current year and this coming year, we have, we have a lot on our plate in terms of getting ready for Common Core and getting ready for Smarter Balance um, assessment. Uh, there's, there's a lot that's going on, but I think it's going to continue to go on. One thing that I would definitely want us to do is to do some kind of a, we could call it a program evaluation, but how has the time been used? And we would, we want to, we would want to make sure moving, you know, as we go along with, with each day that, each time that we use, each half day, um, how has that gone? What can, is there anything that we would have done differently? I think we, you know, we would plan these right down to, you know, the most finite detail that we want, because we, we, would, we would look at them as really, really sacred time. Um, so I, I, what I'm hearing you say, I think, is that it, it would be, you see it as an ongoing. We, we used to have it. I mean, and most districts have some form of early release time. Some have it weekly, some have it, some have it you know, twice a month, some have it monthly. Um, Ideally, I think we need it, and I think we've needed it for a while um, because we, we have such it, our, our planning time for teachers, our professional development time is pretty fragmented, and we have some time that we've used for release time. We've given teachers release time that also requires hiring subs, um, that also requires having teachers, you know, students being um, taught by not their not the regular teacher, um, which we would ideally we would prefer them to be, you know, receiving their instruction from, from their teacher and not, not always a sub. I mean, subs, we're always going to need them. But I think this would, be, this would be a way, I think, where we could really have an ideal situation where, where teachers would have sustained professional development, be able to really work collaboratively together over a period of time that is not going to be just one hour here, 35 minutes here, and then, okay, and then we've got something else that we've got to cover because something is coming up the following week, this would, this would give us some really extended periods of time that I think in the long run is going to enhance our teaching and learning. I don't know if that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess like Barbara, it'd be great to, to see the, the plan for that when it's available. 
And I think, uh, ideally, what we would want to do is we would want to make that plan before the end of this school year, because we would want to be entering the next school year with a really robust plan of how we're going to be using these days. So that, that would be, as the school leader, that would be my plan and how we're going to do that. It wouldn't be like, okay, starting, we wouldn't be going, you know, month to month on how we're going to use it for this time. We would be planning, we would be making those plans, you know, late spring um, into how, what's the work that needs to be done, what are we going to be doing this summer, and then what, what implications does that have for next year, and how we're going to be using those and mapping them out through the year. Okay. That, that's really the best way to, to do curriculum planning and professional development planning um, as well. So I'll say, except when the state throws us curveballs, like with Smarter Balance, which we would have hoped to have trained people on months ago, but until the operating system was working, that was impossible. Right. So. Okay. Um, one piece that I've been thinking about since the last time we talked was we're really trying to build a K-12 <clears throat> district. And the reason being so that students can go between, seamlessly between, uh, a third grader is doing work and they can move into a fourth and fifth grade and sixth grade curriculum as we know that we have many of these uh, students who move up and down and especially with um, the strategic plan coming up we're looking for students to uh, teach us to be able to meet students where they are and meet things. I am nervous about alienating. I feel like it's bringing Pond Cove to its own practices and not keeping Pond Cove aligned with middle school and high school. Um, I, I like to call them buildings rather than different administrations, so it's fluid. The five days uh, makes me very nervous that Pond Cove is doing its own thing and that it's not working with, um, you know, as you say, math is the example. Mm -hmm. Fifth grade, you know, we need, a, we need the middle school math team, uh, at least somebody from the middle school math team, to make sure that we're looking at uh, Pine Cove work and middle school work so that work is seamless. And as that's where we're going in professional development, that's where we're going with, um, what's the name of it, uh, proficiency-based diplomas. That's what we're moving into. Um, so I, that concerns me. Um, another concern I have is that, is this the first thing, like what was your plan this year with that, because you know, October, the um, calendar came out and we started working on, we all knew that we had to change the calendar because it passed. And so before this teach had this great idea, what was the plan? Um, I'm concerned that we had a great idea and that we're not, uh, we're going, oh, let's take the great idea because it has to be voted on for all other, the, the K-12 district. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to vote on this so that people can make their plans. Um, I'm concerned that, you know, say I vote no, what I would think is that that teacher and you at, and that you at Pine Cove would be able to take, you know, use some of, go to the, um, innovation team and say, okay, this is what we need, this is the problem we have, this is how we're trying to get around it. You know, what's some of the, I think I, I asked you last time, what's some of the other work you've done? It's a burden on families um, to have kids out of school. And um, it, is there any other plans that you've made? I mean, what we would do, would, we would have to keep doing the way that we're doing it now, which is, which is somewhat fragmented. I mean, our, our plan for this is, you know, this would be, this would give us the extended time that we need. I mean, right now, we're going from, you know, we have to, we, we cover a lot, of, we, we, we teach everything. So, so unlike, unlike middle and high school, we, our teachers teach everything. So when we make our focus be, say for a staff meeting, this is all around math. And so then, then we have, you know, week, a couple of weeks go by and then we have to make sure that we cover something around literacy. We have to make sure that we, we, we cover something um, around social emotional growth, um, peaceful pond cove work, those kinds of things. And so that's where, that's where it gets tricky, where we, we want to make sure that we're not neglecting one area at the expense of, we could, we could go three, three staff development sessions in a row only on math 
but that's at great expense of something else. And then when we have teams meeting um, for 35 minutes once a week, um, that's, that's, a real, that's a real burden because that's, that's, that's a very, very short amount of time to really get a lot of really robust professional work done. So that's, you know, if that helps you. Um, the plan, I mean, when, when in years past, when I was working for another district, is you, you plan it out for the year. It doesn't mean, as Meredith said, I mean, yeah, there's going to be glitches, something's going to come up that you're going to have to make a shift, you know, on certain days, or at least for certain, you know, a part of that work is going to have, maybe half of that, half of that afternoon is going to, you know, be devoted to something else. Um, we certainly have to be flexible. We, we, we work in a school, we have to do it that way. So I don't know if that helps. Um, the one other thing I just... I was going to respond to your first, the first yeah. part of your question, which is about the concern about Pond Cove sort of being on its own. And I would say, if you think of this as sort of making up for some of the time that Pond Cove teachers don't have, that the middle and high school teachers do have for curriculum planning time and professional learning community work, then it, it's really evening out um, the time more so. And you know, I think our leadership team meets regularly enough that I don't have a concern about the work being on its own. Of course, there's always a need for more of that K-12 work time. Um, and, and we find, the, you know, the three full professional development days we have a year um, really aren't enough to get all of that done. But, okay. I, I look at it, um, with not to belabor, but, you know, the teach, it's hard to create more time for teachers. So one option is to have early release days. Obviously, there's a cost. Children won't be in school. But it's a solution to an issue that sounds like, uh, you know, teachers, you know, we'd prefer to have the regular teachers teaching versus the substitutes. At the same time, teachers want more professional development time. So this is a solution that, um, you know, is listening to what teachers and administrators want. Obviously, parents are going to be disadvantaged, but given all that we have in front of us with the strategic plan, I think this is a, a great solution to several issues that we've heard. Uh, thank you for um, answering all of our questions. Uh, I think one of the major concerns that the board has had is the additional burden that the additional five days so that Panko parents and families would have eight total days. Um, and I appreciate your, um, the survey that you put out asking parents how best to meet those needs for them. Um, should we adopt this calendar as proposed tonight. Um, my suggestion would be to um, make it very clear to those Panko parents who are most impacted by this um, unusual twist in our calendar that this is coming and these are some options that you have mm -hmm. and, and what you're going to be using those days for so they can better understand that it's um, an investment for our students in the long run. And I know we would want to do that. Obviously, the survey was you know, to get a snapshot of AM, PM, who would, who would take advantage of community services offer, offerings, who needs them, who, mm -hmm. who doesn't need them. But I think we would want to dig deeper, just like you know, I mean, I, John mentioned earlier about students that um, need more connections. We would want to do more outreach to families. And, and we have our, you know, we have the connections to the families that we, we I think we, we know we'd win it, but we'd put it out to all families. And, and I like the idea that all of the proposed additional days are on the same day of the week. I think that sort of helps alleviate some of the chaos that half days can throw. In They're predictable. Families, for right. sure. Are there any other questions that we have on the calendar? Okay, I have one more. The other piece I struggle with, because I know this came up a while ago, and um, a couple years ago uh, this came up, and since then we have a vice principal, we have a, a curriculum developer, we have this year a technology developer, a business uh, manager, um, administrator. So we have in our, um, we have a full administrative team. We don't have any holes. So I, um, it's, just, it's tough for me because I hear what teachers need. I'm hearing what teachers need. I just wish that um, it wasn't a, if we don't have this, you're not going to be able to do the work that you need to do. Like, it, it came up this month 
um, it came up right before we were going to do the last vote. So I feel like um, you were going to do it just fine beforehand, and it was kind of a passing comment. And I feel like the district has give, you know has a good support team, um, and that you know we can work. Um, I know. I just feel really. Uh, I, I just feel like. Sending kids, not sending kids to school when we have a full working team is is tough. Um, okay. So I'm just struggling with this. Yeah, I I mean I certainly appreciate the struggle and I you know, understand the challenge that families face in you know needing to care for young children and make alternative arrangements for them and it's not easy for every family. Um, you know. Not all families are created equal and not all families have the same opportunities and resources available. Um, that said, I, I think you can't underestimate the benefit of teachers being able to work collaboratively together on areas like curriculum. Um, it, it, there's no real substitute for that time yep. as well. Thank you. And I think when, when Meredith mentions about collaboratively, one, one huge, huge benefit here is right now our, our grade level teams and our special education team, literacy teams, they have different times where they meet. We do not have a lot of time for cross grade level collaboration, cross you know, regular education, special education, because every, everyone else is teaching when someone else has a time off. So there's, that benefit is a really, really big one. And so when we, when we look at that, that integration is really, really essential um, um, to make sure that we are aligned, to make sure that we are offering opportunities for students who are on different ends of um, you know, a continuum, whether it's academically, social, emotionally, um, in other areas. So I, I think that is another really key piece that speaks to the value of the collaboration. So if that helps, you know, understand in terms of the common time that we would need that would be extended, that, that we see as a huge benefit. So. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Thank you, Kelly, for all your hard work on that. Thank you all. We really appreciate this. We'll have a, we'll have a great plan. I promise. Looking forward to it. May I have a motion in regards to appointing Nikki Dresser to the Community Services Advisory Commission? I move that we appoint uh, Nick Dresser to the Community Services Advisory Commission for a three-year term to expire uh, December 2017. Second. Any discussion? Just want to thank Nikki for standing up um, yet again for the community service work. And I'll just point out there is still another vacant seat on the Community Services Advisory Commission. Any takers? Mariana. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is item 6H. Um, consideration for the athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. I move that we approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations as listed under item uh, 6H. I have a second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Um, 6I, policies? Uh, so these are um, policies for first read, so we, we don't have a vote on this tonight, but I, I can, um, thank you. Um, but I just wanted to um, give a brief overview in each policy of what's, um, what's changing that's important. Um, the first policy, JHCA, which is use of unscheduled class time for high school uh, juniors and seniors. This was brought to us by junior members of the um, student government uh, who were looking uh, particularly to have uh, a little more choice in terms of how they use their junior free time, particularly at the end of the day. Um, there was a 
uh, board member pointed out uh, something about the, the language and, and um, so there may be some additional work that the policy committee does on the, the specifics of the language but I think the, the good news is that the committee is optimistic that we'll be able to um, meet um, the, 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 the request, the, the junior's most important request um, with the, the support of the high school principal and um, so that's good. That's that one. Um, this next one, IKF, is graduation requirements. Uh, and this, this policy contains graduation re requirements uh, for uh, students who fall under the current graduate, what I would call the current graduation requirements, and then um, another set of requirements for students who fall under the proficiency-based the, uh, proficiency graduate uh, diploma requirements. Um, but each of these, I would point out, include um, an opp opportunities to earn credits through uh, alternative pathways, such as distance learning, um, virtual courses, courses not available at Cape, Cape Elizabeth High School, which may be taken at other secondary schools, um, credits through independent study, internship, service learning, dual enrollment courses, extended and extended learning opportunities. So um, that's exciting stuff, too, and related to our strategic plan. Um, and then third, policy IHOA um, regarding student travel and field trips. Uh, the, what we're, one of the things we're looking to do here is to streamline the field trip approval process uh, somewhat so that the, um, the board uh, only gets involved in approval of field trips, which we routinely approve. Um, when they are outside of New England or, uh, or, or two or more overnight, require two or more overnights. Uh, so we're giving the superintendent and administrators more lati latitude to approve New England-based field trips um, with board notification on out-of-state travel. So that's, that's the goal of that is we've had a number of um, special School business special school board special business meetings in order to address approval for field trips, which we routinely approve. So um, we felt that the board had proper notification of student travel that um, the process had, could be streamlined. So, uh, as always, if there are comments from board members or the public on uh, policies before the policy committees, uh, uh, those can be sent to me or to Joe or to Meredith. Um, thank you. You're welcome for your, thank you so much for your work on that and for all of those on the policy committee. Are you still meeting at 7.30 in the morning on Mondays? No, we are meeting on, at 3 p.m. on something fourth like the fourth Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Workshop days. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for your work. <coughs> um, item J. Uh, may I have a motion in regards to administration, administrators' contracts? Uh, I would be happy to do it. You may just do it as a blank. Would you like the list of names for your motion? I would like that very much. That would be fantastic. <laughs> All right, here we go. I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendations for administrator probationary and continuing contract renewals for the 2015-2016 school year for, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce Noel's last name, uh, Kelly Hassan, Julie Nickerson, Mike Tracy, Doug Purdy, uh, Jeff Shedd, Nathan Carpenter, Jeff Thorak, Ruth Ellen Vaughn, Jane Golding, and Noel Harris. Second. I second. Discussion? So I can tell you that um, we are in the midst of negotiating on the um, Cape Elizabeth um, Education Administrators contract. So um, 
we felt that since we really needed to move these along before the March 1st deadline and in a show of good faith that we love our administrators and we would love for them to stick around, we are proposing to sign these contracts this evening. It would be for back for the past year as well as moving forward for the next coming year. And the terms of those contracts would be dictated by the terms of the <clears throat> collective bargaining agreement that is yet to be determined. Any other discussion? Questions? We're, we're really just renewing the, these contracts for next year. Yes. So technically, we're renewing it as, as they are. When we get a collective bargaining agreement, it, will, it may amend or modify these contracts. So technically, we're just yes. renewing it. Right. Okay, seeing no further discussion. All those in favor? Fantastic. Um, item 6K, request for extended unpaid leave. May I have a motion? Um, I move that we consider to request the, uh, I move that we consider to, uh, the request. The re thank you. I move that we consider the request to extend an unpaid leave of absence for the 2015-2016 school year for, for, for Laura Manuel. Laura Manuel. For Laura Manuel. Second. Second. So Laura Manuel is a, a new employee to the district who has been serving as a um, psychologist. <clears throat> she has been out on maternity leave for the past year and she's requesting um, an extension of that for another year to attend to um, family matters. Is there any other information that we should have before the board in considering this request? Have we been able to I was just going to ask if, if we've been able to ascertain whether this is a position that's with someone out that length of time, we've been able to fill satisfactorily as a, in a temporary way. And I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about that possibility. Yeah. I mean, Jane's certainly here to comment on that if need be, but I would, I would say the answer is no. It was, it was difficult to fill that position this year. Um, I don't expect that it will be easier to fill as a one-year position in the future. So th this is uh, this is always difficult for board members. We we um, want to support um, teachers in, in in supporting their families, and and um, we know how difficult um, that that can be. Um, but we have to look at at um, you know we have to ask how 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 we're, everything we do is how everything we do is supporting our students. Um, and the, the, cha the challenge on this one for me is that, as, as it's often the case with an extended leave of absence, is that it's difficult, it's more difficult to fill a position that's a, that's a temporary position than it is to attract somebody to a position that is a, that is a full-time position. So it puts, it puts the district in a position of having to try to fill a position without being able to promise a job that's more than a temporary job and that that becomes that becomes a challenge that is you know may or may not be advantageous to our students um, how have we filled the you know uh, this person's been out already so what have we done to fill the we've need? done what we can to sort of contract for evaluations to be conducted and um, recently we've been able to find someone who was willing, able to fill in for us a couple days a week. You know, is this position, I know we had another person requesting something differently, but I recall that was also a psychologist and is this a uh, you know, evaluation, uh, you know, um, or is it student facing? This is in a classroom position, just maybe the nature of the It's a student. Work. It's a student-facing position. The position involves direct evaluations and observations of students and working with teams and families. Okay. 
I echo John's sentiment. These requests are difficult, balancing and accommodating the needs of our district staff and teachers with the needs of our students and what's in the best interest for the district. I would just throw in there, uh, I may not have this wrong, but I think three years ago there was a similar uh, scenario with a teacher at Pond Cove, and to the extent, um, you know, we, you know, that I believe we did extend under almost identical circumstances. I may have my facts wrong, but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, so. Um, Well, is it a bit easier? Do we were we able to cover that person? Because is it easier to get a substitute for one year at an elementary school versus a psychologist when we work for one year? So uh, I'm not sure how much precedential value that is. Sorry. I, I would say the answer to that is yes. Elementary teachers are more abundant in the um, field than school psychologists. I would, I, would, I would just add that I, I too feel very much for this teacher and her need to attend to her family. I came to appreciate that extended leaves did not serve the students well, nor our ability to hire well. One-year leaves uh, present their own challenges, but I think those are within the realm of what we can offer. I think beyond a year becomes problematic for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. My hope was that... Um when uh, the family situation um, comes to a natural uh, resolution and she's ready to work again, that she applies to Cape Elizabeth and, um, and that the physician, you know, it, it's tough. You, um, hmm. it, you know, it's one of those, it's not an easy answer, but... Um, I'll have to think about the school uh, students first and then employees uh, second in this case. Okay. Any other questions for clarification and discussion on the issue? All those in favor of extending the unpaid leave? Do we have to oh, opposed? Sorry, I'm not used to this part. Okay. Um, item 6L, um, appointing a board representative to the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Negotiation Committees. May I have a motion? Yes, I uh, move that we appoint board representatives to the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Negotiation Committees, uh, Michael Moore, Susanna Mazel hubs to the Administrative Support Personnel in EdTech 1 and EdTech 2 and 3, and John Christie and Kate Williams Hewitt to the Bus Drivers, Custodians, Food Service, and Maintenance Mechanic, uh, I guess, Collective Bargaining Unit. Second. Second. Discussion? I, for one, would really like to thank those members who have stepped up to do negotiations, um, both um, seasoned and new. Appreciate your service. All those in favor? Um, item 6M, consideration to extend the superintendent's contract. May I have a motion? Yes. I move that we extend the superintendent's contract by one year. Second. Michael. Discussion. Um, so I want to begin, Joe, by congratulating you because um, I worked very hard last year as chair to try to encourage Meredith Nato to sign a, a, con a, a contract whose term was aligned with the district's five-year strategic plan so that um, we could be certain to have a superintendent in place 
to both begin and fulfill that that work. And um, I wasn't able to get that done, but but so I want to congratulate you on bringing this to the table tonight. Um, and then I, I just want to go on to say that um, I enthusiastically support um, the extension of this contract. We have. Um, we have a, a, an outstanding superintendent in place, um, and and I, I hope to keep that continuity in our in our leadership position um, throughout uh, the, the, the the term of our strategic plan, at least. Um, Meredith is the the sort of leader who who takes responsibility for setbacks, um, and she gives credit um, for successes. So she um, she won't. Um, she, 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 she would be the first person to point out that none of, um, none of her accomplishments are anything that she has accomplished alone and that many people have been involved in bringing, um, bringing about the, the changes which Meredith has brought about in our district since she um, started here three and a half years ago. But um, since then, we have seen the, the implementation of full-day kindergarten uh, for all of our students. We've seen world language begin in, in first grade instead of in third grade. We've seen um, a refocus on teaching and special education, which I think has been very exciting for that team, according to their presentation to us not long ago. Um, we've revised the district's mission and vision in a way that has um, enthused our, our, our district and refocused uh, ourselves on, on, on a, whole, a whole child approach um, and on multiple pathways and on student passion and creativity. Um, we've, we, Meredith has, um, at the board's request, um, worked collaboratively with all the stakeholders in the district to develop a five-year strategic plan. So it's clearer than it ever was. Um, and I worked under two previous superintendents um, uh, in the past, I know what you're going to say, David. <laughs> I worked with two previous superintendents. Um, and it's clearer than it has been with the, direct, the direction of the district. Um, uh, and one other thing uh, that's gone happened very quietly, but is is that there is now in place a, a, a fully funded 10-year facilities capital improvement plan for the district, uh, including uh, a successful bond initiative uh, just earlier this year. Um, and um, for the first time, we really understand the long-term um, facilities uh, needs of the district. And, and on top of that, um, um, Meredith has, has uh, been instrumental in putting forward uh, three budgets which have been overwhelmingly approved by Cape voters um, and have received uni unanimous votes on the town council, um, which also um, was, was not the way that those um, budgets happened in prior years. So um, I know that not, not all of us have, have worked with Meredith as long as I have, and some folks who haven't worked with Meredith as long as I have may, may feel that this, this um, uh, this motion comes before us, um, you know, where in, before they've, they've had time to make um, a, a full uh, decision. But uh, having worked with Meredith for two years as chair and a year before that as, as a vice chair, um, I feel uh, very confident in, in enthusiastically extending this contract. Thank you. So thank you. I also support uh, extending Meredith's contract by one year. I think aligning her contract with the strategic plan uh, provides continuity. Um, I also think uh, having someone in the district over that time of strategic plan is important to have a different type of continuity. We know as a board change is extremely challenging. We also know the recent history of the district to have you know different superintendents. Um, didn't create an atmosphere or opportunity to have difficult conversations. Um, and you know, the, these are issues and conversations that there may be difficult, there may be issues that need, there are issues that need to be addressed for us to uh, achieve the goals of the strategic plan. And I think, um, you know, 
changing or not having someone uh, as superintendent during that strategic plan would just defer these conversations and some of the challenges we need to overcome. Um, so I wholeheartedly support extending her contract and um, I'll leave it at that. I'd also like to say that I enthusiastically support the renewal and I'm grateful for the um, the punctuation point um, in time to just reassert that we are committed and believe in you know the direction that we're headed and and have put faith in in your ability to guide us there thank you All right. Well, I'll, I'll be the outlier here as the new, newbie on the board. I'm, I'm having difficulty with the very brief time we've had to discuss what I consider to be a really, really important role of the board, which is the superintendent's contract. And this is not at all taking away from the accomplishments that all of you list. But I always look at big issues like this as sort of a triangle. And the middle is the superintendent's contract and her sort of fiduciary role with the board. Uh, Meredith has two and a half years remaining on her contract. I always saw those as sort of a start and end deal from which we um, set goals with her, look at challenges, look at positives, and go forward. So one of, my, one of my points is there's still two and a half years left, and there is sort of a, uh, an expectation of evaluation of your superintendent with goal setting. So, th so the context for me in this tonight is, is, is very puzzling. I, it, it's not feeling timely to be talking about adding a year and 150,000 plus dollar uh, of uh, contra contractual time with the district outside of the evaluation process. Commensurate with that is Meredith willing to share with us that she's entering some pretty serious conversations with the Cape Elizabeth Education Association around some questions teachers have about uh, the timing of the plan, I, morale issues, trust, whatever you want to call it. And I would, I am completely confident that this can happen within the context of her work with the association, but I would have preferred that to be coming with us as part of goal setting around her evaluation. That would make some sense to me that we have um, an independent evaluation happen of climate in the culture and that we set goals together and that such an extension uh, be, uh, have that formally in place before we went forward. So I'm, I'm going to vote no, not because I don't appreciate all that's done, and I certainly understand your sense of wanting her contract to match the uh, five-year plan, but, but for me the context isn't quite feeling correct, and I feel this has been a fairly rushed decision. Joe. David. Um, I actually made an outline for once, which is unusual yeah. for me. And I'm going to work backwards because I want to address some concerns of uh, Barbara, which I understand she hasn't worked with Meredith for three years that I have. Uh, but there's a very practical reason why we're doing this. And I'm going to say all kinds of nice things after I say a very practical economic reason. There are 15 open superintendent slots in this state. There are tons more in Massachusetts. Um, we almost lost it. This is like signing up a star pitcher for an extra year. We'd be fools not to do this. That's my opinion. I do not want to lose her, and I certainly want to spend two years to find someone that's half as good. And I'm confident that's what we will be doing. And so the fact that we're, we have this opportunity, it's almost like me signing, uh, I can't think of a baseball player that isn't tainted, but uh, oh, uh, um, the quarterback for the Patriots. It's, we have a chance to extend the contract. We take it while we can. There's way too much competition out there, and for, especially for somebody as high quality as, um, as Meredith. That's why I think we are, it is appropriate at this time to do it. We have recently, you were not part of it, reviewed her. We have noted in our review, both Meredith and all of us, some areas we all need to work on. I mean all of us, everybody in this school district from the school board on down. And I know Meredith is fully committed to doing that. I'm fully committed to doing that, so is the board. I'm comfortable that the teachers will do that, and it's not a difficult problem to work through. It's done in industry all the time. But um, so that's the practical reason for the haste of signing my star player while I still can before somebody else, like the Yankees, snap them up. And I can flood this sports metaphor a bit. 
But um, I wouldn't go through all, all of John's lists, but I agree with them, having been through them all. But there's also additional things. We've all been faced with some tough things for all teachers in school districts, Common Core, proficiency-based standards. This has been a lot, really tough couple of years. And Meredith has been unbelievable in dealing with it. And there's, it's just difficult for everybody. And uh, I have served with three superintendents. Uh, um, I have talked to people around the state. I've been to associations I've talked to, and I can't name them, but some people in the state who have experience with a lot of superintendents in the state. And Meredith is, is thought, even though she's only been here three years, is one of the best in this state, if not the best. And on a personal level, I have watched her. I've, I've, as a bankruptcy lawyer, I've taken over many, many companies and run them, from large hospitals to large multi-state companies. And I've seen a lot of leaders, some good, some bad. I think Meredith's one of the best leaders I've ever seen. And um, I think in terms of her quality, her knowledge, her integrity, her honor, and quite frankly, her brilliance, I, I don't think I've seen anybody, any industry that I would pick to lead something as important as my school district over Meredith. In fact, I would pick our hands down. So I, it's just a higher word than enthusiastically. I strenuously, I, I absolutely support uh, this, and I think we'd be crazy not to lock her in for an additional year if we can. That's it. Okay. Um, I guess I would add, since what everybody has added, a different element in his. Um, Meredith is the first one to come to the board and tell us this isn't going well, this isn't going, this isn't going well, this is what my plan is, this is what uh, my goal is, this is what I'm attempting to do, this is how I'm trying to bring along people for this vision. And she asks her opinion and uh, we give it to her and she uh, admits I could have done this better and I could have done that better. But never has she said um, anything else I've gotten from Parents, um, I do have some high schools, so the way high schools uh, talk, and when they're in the back seat of my car, or now in the driving in the seat of my car, about um, the school and the new initiatives that are happening. Um, teachers who call me, there is all, I've already heard it from Meredith, and she's working on it. Um, I think that's the human element that everyone has a voice here and. One of the biggest things is the innovation <coughs> committee. There are spaces for teachers, for staff, for administrators um, to come and say, I'd like this changed, I'd like this to be done differently. And it's not alone. Um, it might not be, people might not be open to using it um, fully yet. My hope is that teachers as, um, and then all staff, start to use that process and then uh, what, what I see in Meredith's work um, can be more um, universally seen. So I fully support Meredith and um, I actually want to thank the board for thinking of this and thanking for the staff for um, hearing what we're saying and giving it an open arms um, because we've certainly um, value what staff has said and we're not taking this as um, lightly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I echo um, what John and David and Susanna and Michael and Kate have said. Um, working with Meredith, has, she has demonstrated a level of intelligence and working knowledge um, that has um, compared to no others that I have ever worked with before. And I'm pleased that um, she is willing to consider sticking with the district after having been actively recruited. Um, it has only highlighted the um, value that you bring to our district. <clears throat> and that value has been recognized by others throughout the New England region by, and nationally by being appointed to the um, council as well as by other school districts who recognize talent when they have it. Um, and I'm also pleased that with this motion, hopefully tonight, we can demonstrate the support that we show in Meredith and the work that's before us as the district. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? 
Thank you. Um, item 6N, consideration to approve the Cape Elizabeth Program of Studies, 2015-2016. I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth Program of Studies, 2015-2016. Second. Discussion? Yes. John is first. Is, 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 we have a, is there a timeline on when this is, when we need to approve this? Jeff, do you want to speak to that? Uh, I don't have it memorized, but yes, in the sense that we uh, are scheduled to start having to select courses for next year, next month. Um, I can't remember exactly when it is next month, but it's fairly early. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I haven't had much time with this, and so I could be wrong, but I speak to my, my concerns, and, and there, it's easy because we just reviewed the graduation policies, and I don't see in, in here the presentation of the opportunities around al alternative ways of, of, of obtaining credit or demonstrating proficiency at Cape Elizabeth High School. Cape Elizabeth High School <coughs> that are available to students by policy, but this but the policy is is something that goes on the buried in the school board's page of the website and um, probably rare, very rarely read. This is distributed. I I think I'm not a high school parent, but I think yes. distributed yes. to parents. <laughs> this is this is the best way to present what <coughs> pathways are available to students, and I don't see those pathways here. So. Do we have time, my question is, do we have time to incorporate our expected graduation requirements into this before we send it to parents? That's a really good question. I mean, I have, <clears throat> I certainly, we could certainly create something. I actually thought that in the beginning of the program of studies, there's a description of independent study, there's a, I thought but I could be wrong, John, that there's a description of, um, I'm not sure work study is in there, but I thought there was a description of the opportunity to take courses through college and that sort of thing, but if I'm wrong, we can certainly do that, um, and we can do it fairly quickly because we've been doing that for years anyway. So. If it does, it, do, it, it doesn't present it in a way, it, it present, if it does, and I'm not sure it does, it, there's a lot about, you know, writing a letter to the superintendent and, you know, there's, there, are, there are certainly ways that I saw in here of, of pursuing different pathways, but they weren't, we weren't welcoming um, that, that approach. We were describing, you know, how you, how you might go about a, a different path. Um, in, a, in exceptional, it's what seemed to be exceptional circumstances. If I could add on to that, I, I sort of noticed the same thing, Jeff. If you look at the last page 34, it has a couple of distance education mentions, and then it mentions work study, which might be thinking of, but it's, it's not the laundry list of what we've come up with in the uh, policy. And, and, um, um, and I, I even know that there's something that's not in here, but I know it's offered because my son took it, that he got approval to take courses, and, although he didn't get a credit for it. And I don't know why that's not a credit thing, but, and I'm gonna probably ask that it should be credit if somebody can pass. As you know, you take a math class, you tutor, you take the final one semester, take the final next semester, and you pass them, you should get credit. Um, but that's another pathway that people have that, yep. that's not, I know it's articulated because I've seen it in with the guidance office, but I don't see it in this packet. And um, um, and then I had one other question, so I agree with what John says, I think this thing, I think what John wants is, is a cell drop, is to tell these people there's all these other alternatives here in a way that presents it to them. And the way it's now, it's, it's very similar to where it's always been, and that's all. And the other question I have is just a simple one. We have course levels and grades, and I'm sure I'm missing something. We have honors and advanced placement, college prep, and high school diploma. I read every single one of these course things. Every single one of them was either college prep, honors, or AP. I didn't single, see a single diploma course. I said it's a couple unleveled, but what's the diploma course if it's not in the book? 
I, I honestly don't know that. Yep. That's a great question. And um, essentially what happens is when we have a need, when kids are struggling in certain CP classes, we will create sort of a category. But they usually, <coughs> kids who are given diploma level credit, are within the context almost always of a CP class that they're taking. Um, we have in the past advertised classes as diploma level classes. And what typically happens is that nobody will sign up for them. Um, so that's why you don't see separate diploma level courses well, listed. Then I would suggest that maybe we put in here somewhere a description of how one can get a diploma level course. It, it, even though you don't list it as a course, but it doesn't tell me how, I, how you get it. So what, I mean, what both your question and John's questions are pointing up is there's a lot of things that we do that, um, and have done for years that happen, um, and they're spelled out in various documents, but they're not sort of um, uh, hallmarked as much, or underlined, or um, e emphasized. And certainly, I would be glad to do that. It wouldn't take long to turn something over to Meredith. It's a question of how long it would take before um, the board could approve it without sort of setting seriously back our um, course sign-up process. The next business meeting is March 10th at this juncture. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yep. <coughs> I, I again, I don't have the, I don't have it memorized. Um, mm -hmm. um, I know we start the process. The first go round is with eighth graders. Actually, begin the process the earliest. Um, but. Meredith and I can work out uh, the details. The other possibility may be to do a supplement to this. If, if it's necessary to approve this, we can always do a supplement and approve that later. Because they don't seem as, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I had the same point as John. And then I had one other point on page three. And you're talking about, I, I know we don't have, uh, I didn't see a lot of efficiency-based diploma guidelines in here, and I'm not sure if we're ready for that, but at some point we have to. But I did notice on the planning for the math course selection, we had the same standard, we want you to have at least Algebra 2 by the, because you have to take by your junior year, because you have to take the SAT. And I remember pointing this out when it came time for it, that the guidance office should look at, I'm not going to blame the guidance office, somebody should look at the SAT, and I, when I did, I looked at it, and, most people, some people take it earlier than, uh, was it April at the standard time? May, May, April or May. Okay, a lot of them take it earlier, in which case, if they don't take Algebra 2 until their junior year, they're not going to be fully prepared to take the SAT. We're hoping to alleviate that. But also, quite frankly, when I read the SAT thing, I found that there was on it described, it was at least 10% of it was called pre-calculus. So, if we're trying to prepare kids for SAT tests, and I raised that issue. Uh, and maybe teachers prepare them for it, but um, you say it in preparation, I'm just saying it's, what you're saying in preparation for SAT is not quite consistent with what the SAT says you need to prepare for. So I don't know if it's something you have to fix, but I, I'm the one who caught that, and I'm not sure kids know about it. Maybe the teachers do, but. Might I make a suggestion? Um, <coughs> anybody, uh, given we don't know the timeline, and I don't think we'd want to, you know, uh, I imagine we have to approve this or it wouldn't be before us, correct? It well, doesn't I sound like we have to approve it tonight. Oh, but yeah. It doesn't sound to me as if we have to approve it tonight. Sh should we approve it and then they can always bring forward a An new improved amended one just in case? Uh, I would move that we table it until March 10th okay. and so that we can incorporate our, our <coughs> the graduation requirements that will be in place for ninth graders starting uh, in September. So their, their families and, the, and those students can have a good sense of what those requirements are. Is there a second for that motion? I second. All those discussion? Uh, the only thing I'd say is if there is another timeline, um, it takes four of us to meet, and I'm happy to meet if, uh, we, if you have an earlier timeline. If you meet, need it March 9th, if you need it March 8th. Yeah, and I could have something done with the data. Well, 
I would echo what you said. If if there's if you get something that incorporates the comments ready in a week, I meet in a week. I don't care. I think we can find a forum if you need yeah. it. Or at the workshop, we could have a brief special meeting. This is true. We do have a workshop coming up on the 25th. We could hold a special business meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure if it has to be a business meeting as long as it's a public meeting. Well, and as a matter of fact, that will be a quite public meeting. All right, so uh, it's been tabled. Do we all have to vote on that or are we good to go? Is this well, a motion to second and you have to vote? Right. So the motion on the table, no pun intended, is to table this particular item. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your work on that, Jeff. Um, okay, item seven, committee reports. Any, any committees? Uh, we might as well do the evaluation committee, but I'll ask you, Meredith, to, um, because we're having a the workshop. So we're scheduled for a workshop this coming Friday. Uh, the evaluation committee members and evaluation committee, uh, teachers on the evaluation committee were, um, many of them are bringing other teachers with them, but with uh, Kim Marshall, who is the um, researcher, educator who created um, the rubrics that our committee has chosen to utilize moving forward. So it will be an opportunity <coughs> to hear from him about the rationale for those pieces and his view on um, what they represent in the classroom. Thank you. Any other community reports? We've already heard from the policy committee, hard at work. I just, uh, around legislation, um, I did write a piece to the uh, Ed and Cultural Affairs Committee supporting the extension on the teacher evaluation. And I wondered, Meredith, if there's any update on where that stands? No, I spoke with Bob Hassan today at MSSA. I know Sarah Harrington, our, one of our teachers on the evaluation committee, one of the co-facilitators uh, testified yesterday. She was eloquent and mm -hmm. well um, heard, or her message was heard well, I think, or received well. Um, but I don't have an update on where the committee is likely to vote. Always a mystery. Excellent. Any other committees? No, I, I would just say for pass, uh, just to remind um, eight, you know, parents of eighth graders or ninth graders at, um, that they are always open to scheduling um, visits. And if the middle school would like them to come and do um, a presentation to the middle school, that's something that they are happy to do also. So. Oh, I think that would be great. Um, we, since the Mom Community Services Board, is that something I bring up now? Or? Sure. I, I can't find the next day or our next meeting. Uh, we've had one meeting, uh, we have another meeting scheduled. The reason why I want to announce, uh, uh, we're going to have on the agenda an item so that high school kids can use the fitness center at a significantly reduced rate. So I kind of wanted the high school person to hear me say that but she's texting somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that was I don't blame her. <laughs> she was texting that update. <laughs> That's right. She's just letting everyone know. That right. it, 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 it's going to be jam-packed tomorrow, Dave. Well, <laughs> I didn't say a date because I, I don't know what it is, but the point of it is is that it, it's in the high school building. We, it is a weight room. It is an exercise room. We, we don't have another one in the high school that's worth anything. And, and to allow high school kids to work out in there at a significantly reduced rate, like like college kids, is something that we're going to discuss at that meeting. I think it would be helpful if the high school kids, some high school kids showed up. They have to look, not on my calendar, but it's on some calendar. When that yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to pull it up. I'll find out for you while we move on. Uh, any other committee reports? Thomas Morrill Library is um, proposed to be yellow with white trim and to go with the terracotta um, base. That's the proposed um, color like scheme. Town Hall. A lot like Town Hall. Yep. That could be pretty. Come to the meetings, you can pick chairs. That's what's happening next. <laughs> oh no, the photos. Um, we'll wait on that because that's a parent. Um, Okay. I think it's not a school board issue, it's a parent. Um, okay. Forget I high, Yeah, high school parent okay. association. Um, any other committee reports? 
Okay. Um, school board agenda item requests. If we have any, we could talk about them now. Or if there are any requests for future agenda items, if you could email myself or Meredith. <coughs> Um, we would need those requests by the Thursday before our next business meeting, or even the Monday before our next business meeting, so we can discuss the agenda, because we have an agenda and a meeting then. So that would be March, did we say March 2nd is our next meeting? March so second. March 3rd? March 2nd. March 2nd. Um, and then uh, announcements for upcoming meetings. Um, I want to make an announcement for our upcoming business workshop. Um, but before I make that announcement, I wanted to poll the committee on their availability of potentially moving our regularly scheduled next budget workshop meeting from Tuesday, February 24th, um, originally scheduled for the library to be instead um, rescheduled to Wednesday, February 25th, to be held in the town council chambers. Um, and the reason for moving that one particular budget item is so that we could broadcast live the presentation, the initial presentation of the school board budget. Um, and we want to give as many folks as and much opportunity to access that as information as soon as possible. So I wanted to ask the board first whether or not they were available um, that evening. And then we still have one other piece. Do you know if we have someone? Some I don't know yet. I, I, we don't know yet. Okay. We're, so first, first things first. Is there a board availability on Wednesday the 25th as opposed to Tuesday the 24th? Uh, I, I can do it. Well, I can that do it. would be really important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's fine>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for you. Thank you, Mike. So. <clears throat> Am I seeing nods? Yes. It's okay. I've said it's okay. It's, yeah, it's not great, but it's okay. I prefer Tuesday, but, but, I, but I, I support the public presentation of the budget and would be here to support it. You can watch it electronically. No, I, 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 would, I would attend. If we, move, if we moved it, I'll make it work. Okay. David? Well, the, I just noticed, I found that the Keep Community Services Board is <laughs> at 6.30 p.m. on the 25th. But I think That's the bu budget's perfect because I think the intent was to do the overview of the district budget and to do the community services budget that same evening. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you when you pointed that I'm out. sorry, I think the intent was to do the community services advise, the community services budget that following the district budget presentation that same evening. So you can bring them all with you. Um, and the high school students. I'm tired, but afterwards or before? Or? During. During. Whatever. I'll, I'll be there. We'll talk with Russell. Susanna. It's fine with me. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so pending the availability of staff for the booth, um, we will be moving that meeting to the council council chambers. Just to be clear, six thirty. You we'll will be joining not be you here. virtually. <coughs> you wouldn't have been here on the twenty fourth. Correct. I'll be um, joining you virtually. Virtually. And it's six thirty start time, or yeah, I believe Same the time. school board. Workshops, workshops are set six thirty. Six thirty. Okay. Are there any other announcements of upcoming meetings? No. Yes. Just, just to reiterate, policy is Tuesday, uh, the twenty fourth of February at three p.m. And then on March fourth, not a meeting, um, but the book group on world class learners. The middle school library learning commons at 6 30. 6 30 march 4th mm -hmm. excellent um hope has the meeting on um rescheduled that's march 5th the rescheduled presentation on um internet safety internet safety for parents okay. any other announcements for upcoming meetings uh no <laughs> Um, may I have a motion to I, I move that we adjourn. A second. All those in favor? Seven. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs>